Lake City Council, I've said that before. If anybody is not familiar with our uh, 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 procedures on work sessions, our uh, procedures are a little more informal because we do not make uh, uh, binding decisions except to give instruction to uh, staff. Um, uh, at every meeting, uh, at the beginning, we have uh, uh, the following statement concerning the uh, uh, settlement of the franchise fee uh, case, and it goes as follows. I'd like to provide information regarding the settlement of the franchise fee case. The District Court has granted preliminary approval of a settlement of the franchise fee case, Hauser versus City of Billings, DV 2018-0778. If you are a customer of the City's water, wastewater, and or solid waste disposal services between February 2nd, 2015 and June 30, 2018, you may be a class member. Information regarding the proposed settlement can be found at the following website www.cityofbillingsfranchisefeesettlement.com. There are also several copies of the settlement notice for this class action case in the back of the City Council Chambers. The court will conduct a fairness hearing in this case at the Yellowstone County Courthouse located at 2217 North 27th Street, Billings, Montana, uh, on November 17, 2023 at 9 a.m. in room 414. <clears throat> Copies of the statement are also um, on the cart back there, as are uh, as is a new uh, 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 flyer that provides some additional information relating to the uh, error that was made by the class administrator in sending out postcards uh, to people who might uh, uh, be potential class members or excluded class members. And so if you're interested in that, it is, um, the details are on um, uh, the card on this sheet. Uh, kind of the bottom line there is that that error was made by the class administrator, um, a third party, not by the city of Billings, and the class administrator is in the process of resending a couple of the postcards to the two different groups. And uh, the cost of that will be covered by the class administrator. So um, more details on that are available on the cart on the sheet. Uh, so uh, with that, um, <clears throat> we will uh, move on. Our first item is um, uh, public uh, comment. And this is an opportunity to be heard on anything that's either on our agenda or not on our agenda. If you have comment on something that is on our agenda, though, and you can, I encourage you to wait uh, because at the con or partway through each of those items, we'll have an opportunity for public comment on those particular items. But if you've got to go um, or leave the meeting, and if you, uh, or if you want to comment on something that's not on our agenda, this is the opportunity. So please, uh, if you're interested, come forward. Uh, just ask to keep your comments to three minutes. Tell us your name and address uh, at the beginning of your comments. Is there any public comment? Mayor, Council, thank you. Wesley Dunn, Dorothy Lane, Heights, Montana. That little handout that I gave you is uh, I pulled off the internet. It was a little something that um, I thought was kind of interesting. Been here for about eight months, coming to this, watching everybody do their thing, and I'm learning. So I picked that out, and I just wanted to give that to y'all, but I also wanted to state something that I had on my mind about um, a meeting that was held two or three weeks ago. So, what the people see a city council member as. People see a council member as being their voice. People see a council member as a person who ensures local communities run as smoothly and efficiently as possible. While also helping to make sure citizens are able to access the services and programs they need to live safe and healthy lives. All people, all people see you as someone who fights for our rights. No matter what they may be at that time, whether it be property rights, safety, helping find <coughs> solutions to problems in our city that affect us, or by debating our gun laws and codes. The point is, we elected each of you to protect our rights, stand up for us, enforce codes, make sure ordinances are followed, and hold people accountable when they need to be. 
the handout that I have given you may be some of the responsibilities of council members. Thank you. Thank you. Is there additional uh, public comment this evening? Any other public comment before I close it? Okay, uh, there's no one online, no one's coming forward, so close our public comment period and move on to uh, our first order or our first item. But before I do, Chris, I'll just give you an opportunity if there's anything that you uh, wanted to uh, alert us to before we move into item number one, Billings Bench Water Association Agreement. I don't. We've got legislative update later, so we'll touch on that briefly. And with all that's on the agenda, I'll turn it right over to Debbie to roll into the first item. Thank you. Public Works Director. All right. Good evening. Um, I did send this out early, and the council packet had the uh, basically the basis of our understanding. So it's a little bit easier to read, but everything that's in there is going to be in the agreement that you'll see next week. So uh, just a recap of what our West End project entails. Uh, we planned on having a water pump station and intake, uh, raw water pipeline, the reservoirs, and then the plant. So um, when we decided this was the basis of our design, it was looking at different options for each one of these things. Specifically, today we're going to talk about the options of the raw water pump station, the intake, and the pipeline. So we made these decisions, and then inflation happened. And you saw the percentages that we've been showing on the type of inflation we've seen over the last couple of years. And when you multiply that by a $150 million project, it's a really big number. And so staff has been working very hard to try to figure out how to bring this project in on the original budget that we talked about, even though we've been seeing these just unprecedented inflation numbers. So one of our solutions is to take out the intake pump station and pipeline and replace it with um, a conveyance through the BBWA canal. This was originally one of our plans, and it was a, it's a solid plan. Um, we went away from it because we wanted to have control and because we wanted to make sure we had winter operations. So we don't have a lot of operational flexibility when we're relying on something that only runs in the summer. So we've been working quite a bit with the BBWA to determine, can we use this for more than just that irrigation season? And if so, um, we've worked on how can we run this system only using it certain times. So is this a great solution? No, but there's reasons for it. So um, the basis of the agreement, like I said, was in that packet I sent. Um, these were a combination of meetings with the board and our staff to determine what we could come up with here. The first thing, and this is an important one to the BBWA, is that we are not the priority user of this, this canal. It is the irrigators. It's why they're there. It, they're protected by state law because they're irrigators and all that kind of thing. So they want to make sure that their purpose and their mission is kept um, clear. We're okay with that because we have 40 days in our reservoir. So if we do have a week where we can't get water or we have a little bit of time where we need to stop pulling it off the river, we can do that. That's why we have storage. So we can do it. That's part of one of those why we wanted the to own the system and why we wanted the... Um, capability of basically doing anything we wanted. So um, it does say in there, though, that there will be a good faith effort on their part to provide us water. And so if there is something damaged, they need to repair it quickly so that we can get water as soon as possible. It's basically what they do anyway because they have users, so um, we don't think that's a stretch. There's a lot of capital improvements that need to be made. I will show you pictures of those and kind of explain what we're talking about. Ownership in the O&M completely still belongs to the BBWA. We are simply using it for conveyance. The only exception to that is our diversion structure. So where we pull out the water into our reservoirs, we'll own that structure, but everything else is still owned by the BBWA, managed and maintained by them. Uh, the annual fee, this was a tough one. So we based it on a volume, how much we're gonna be taking out, and then they said, well, it has to be worth our while. This isn't our main purpose, this isn't why we're here. And so we basically looked at that and said, okay, this is what we can get to by coming up with our, you know, looking at the cost, looking at your costs, this is what we come up with. And I think I came up with 120,000 maybe in that uh, memo. And they came back and said, how about 150? So <laughs> that was uh, kind of how the negotiation went. Um, I think the key to that is that our operations, if we're at the river, cost more than that. Just power costs alone are almost double that number. So we are still in good shape with the annual fee here. Basically, they're conveying it instead of us paying power costs to do it. So uh, we will use our own water rights. So we are not using their water rights. It keeps us outside of actually being a shareholder. Um, we aren't, they have 
I think 700 CFS is their water right. We have 74 CFS that we can draw on any time. We're gonna use our own water rights, which means also in the winter, if we do have a couple nice weeks and we can run it, we're gonna run it at 74 CFS. We're gonna get as much water into our reservoir as we can quickly. And then the contract duration, uh, we wanted to make sure we had 20 years because if we put a lot of work into this and if they put a lot of work into it, we don't wanna just walk away in a year or two. So there are clauses though that allow us to get out if we find another way to bring water in, that kind of thing. Um, it does give us that ability. But it, it means that we do have the potential to use it for 20 years. So the capital improvements basically exist at the head gate. Um, the flume, which was the cover picture there, the diversion structure, which we will construct, and that's our facility, and then lining the canal in a couple of different places. So here's why it's important. This is the head gate. You can see it's near Laurel, um, actually just east of Laurel. And the head gates do not work in the winter, and they're not low enough, and we're gonna need to make sure we do some modification on this to be able to draw off um, outside of that irrigation season. Um, for being as old as it is, it's in really good shape. So we actually, uh, it, we were pleasantly surprised at the condition of this. The Canyon Creek flume is uh, over Canyon Creek, as we said, and this is one of the places that if we need to ever offload water, we can do it off of this into Canyon Creek. But you can see it's an old wood structure that's over 100 years old. Um, this is a picture this winter when we talked about whether we could use it in the winter. This scared us a little bit. Um, and the, the key behind using this in the winter will be we don't want to damage our facility. So the last thing we want to do is fill this with water and then have it freeze and, and um, cause it to de deteriorate faster. So there is some work to do here, but it's not overwhelming. Um, structurally, it's in good shape. Uh, so we'll be doing a little bit of work with them as far as some of those um, unloaders, the gates on the sides, um, and the, the ability to do this during the winter, it'll help us to have this um, upgraded a little bit. The diversion structure that we're talking about will look a lot like this. It'll have screens and it basically will just, it's, it's a big head gate that's um, gonna be enhanced a little bit because we want screening on it. So it'll look a lot like this. The canal lining is because right now they are drawing their maximum amount at the, at the river. They're drawing it out, but by the time they get to their end user, they've had enough seepage and usage that they have no more water in there. So they don't have the capacity to put another 30 CFS into their canal for us. So what we're gonna do is line parts of the canal that will reduce their seepage by 30 CFS, which means then we have the capacity to be able to use it. So that is why we're lining the canal. They do have some grants and we're gonna help them match those grants, but there is grant money available for that lining. So we're gonna work with them to get that done. So the pros and cons of this, really the capital cost of that intake pump station and pipeline is $35 million. We did bid that. Um, we know that number, it's 35 million, which is a big number. With all the improvements we think we need, uh, it'll be about 3 million. So capital cost wise, it makes a lot of sense even though we do lose some flexibility. The O&M costs, like I said, uh, the O&M costs alone are lower with the annual fee versus using just power cost. And then the offloader option for the BBWA, when we build our diversion structure, if there is a breach of that down further, we're gonna be able to pull off a lot of water. So this gives us a little bit of flood control as well for anything that happens on the BBWA. Um, problems, like I said, limited operations in the winter and uh, we're a secondary user. So if the irrigators need the water, we don't get the water. We don't think that's gonna be an option, a, a real risk for most of the year. So council actions on Monday, you'll see the agreement. Actually, you, will, you saw it in your packet that came out today. So um, you'll have that agreement. In June, uh, you'll see a budget that shows $3 million for o and for BBWA improvements. That'll be for this, these different, um, the diversion structure, canal linings, that sort of thing. We are trying to get a mitigation grant for that. Um, so we, uh, we put in a letter this week um, for that uh, mitigation grant. So hopefully you get a chance to approve the receipt of that grant. That's my optimistic moment. Um, and then you'll see construction contracts this next year come in. So that is what we have. Uh, I would point out, uh, Council Member Neese asked some questions today about water quality. The water quality at this location is actually better than downstream because the Clark's Fork doesn't come in until later. And so we're pulling this out upstream of the Clark's Fork, which has fewer nutrients, less sediment, 
a um, little bit better water quality. So that was one issue that, that we talked about today. I think that's it. It is. Okay, thank you, uh, Debbie. Uh, questions for Debbie, uh, Councilor Joy, Councilor Shaw. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. And I did have a question about water quality, but you've already uh, answered that. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about, you know, this plan was to create re create a redundancy. So, is the plan as it kind of is seen right now that the older plant will continue for that winter use? I mean. You know, looking at the limitation of not having that water available in the winter, how, how do you see that happening? Thank you. So I'll answer this, and Lewis Ingalls, who's actually going to run the plant, is uh, here. So if he doesn't like my answer, he'll probably come up and uh, expand on it a little bit. Um, we use in the winter about 15 million gallons a day. Our existing plant is 60 million gallons per day. So we have the ability to use meet that winter demand for many, many, many years. Um, our hope and our need for this project is that we need to shut down occasionally and do maintenance. So during the winter, we have not been able to take that plant offline ever. And so we really need that plant to be able to take the one plant off, do all the maintenance that we never get a chance to do, um, and then run the other plant um, for those periods in the winter. We have 40 days of storage. So if we need to do that in the winter, we can draw out of those reservoirs for over a month. So if something happens, the struggle that we have at our existing plant now is we see icing during periods of low river level and cold times. We see a lot of icing because of the type of intake we have. We'll be able to use this plant during those time periods and probably will. I would guess most winners will switch over to this plant and use water out of the reservoir. Thank you. Council Member Shaw. Thank you. Um, oh, I appreciate you guys. You're always so innovative and you bring us, <laughs> I know it's not maybe the ideal or exactly what you had planned. Um, my question is, it, and I, it sounds to me like these are pretty discrete parts so that if we ever did need to build the water intake off the river, we could do that at some point. I would assume that's one of the escape clauses that we could get out. Is that is that right? I mean, that's exactly right. Okay. So if we find this doesn't work or we really need more time in the winter or something, yes, if we can fund that other facility. And and I think over time we need to plan it. So yeah, it could okay. Be 20 years from now. Okay. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, Debbie, a question a little bit on that uh, <clears throat> score is if we move ahead with this, uh, uh, but at some point we need to change. Uh, it's either not working for us or it's not working for the ditch company. <clears throat> Are we running the risk of uh, losing an opportunity to acquire a right of way? Um, and would it be possible to acquire right of way so that we have that in our back pocket? Otherwise, uh, subdivisions are going to grow up. Uh, the cost of acquiring that land may really go up. So I would be a little concerned that we would get a little too comfortable with this option and that could be dangerous long term. Can you just comment on that issue? I can. So we purchased the land at the river. So that's already in the city's name. So where the intake and the pump station go is already in our name. So we have, we have that. The pipeline is um, all except one small portion in right of way. So it's generally county right of way for most of that, but that's where we were going to work. I think there's a couple, um, I'm hoping Lewis knows how many easements we were needing to get. Do you remember? Sorry, I should have had that. Um, so there are a few easements and yes, we can look at whether it would be good to acquire those now. Yes. Okay, thank you. Questions, Council Member uh, Pearson? So Debbie, where does that put our budget with the reservoir? Is this, are you going to give that to us later? I'd rather not give it to you today. Okay. Um, no, this gets us much closer. We're not on yet, but this gets us much closer to where we were, where we need to be. And so as a follow-up, and this may be to Chris, if we get the $8 million through legislation, <coughs> where would that go? Would it go at all towards this to, to make the reservoir happen, or is it going to go to the conservation area? So, uh, Councilman Puritan, Mayor and Council, so what you're, what you're referencing is the $8 million that's in House Bill 5. It is not for any of these, the components of the reservoir itself, intakes, water plant. It's exclusively in the area of the conservation components for the region. So, and remember, when we... I'm, I'm going to round numbers, too, if you give me a little bit of grace. Pre-COVID, pre a lot of things, you know, this project was closer to 125. Then it ballooned to 180-ish. We didn't 
have a lot of public conversations about that. Now the number we said in Helena is 153 is where we currently are in the ballpark with this being probably the most significant financial pivot. Where I want to get an answer to your question, we still have not said where we're going to get the funds to do the work at the reservoir that cannot be funded with water rates. So where this project is 100% water rate paid for, being paid for, um, and so, and, and the budget is not included. We'll talk about that later. But the budget uh, does not have, it's a part of the bonding conversations we've been having with park projects. This has been one of those. Thank you. Any other questions? Council Member Denise? Mayor, I just want to disclose I am a, a uh, water renter from the, the ditch company. And so I will continue to have conversation on this, but I have no influence on what them do. I just am a customer. I pay my annual rent to them. Yeah, Council Member uh, Nice. Or I'm sorry. I'll go now. <laughs> Council Member Ripsis. <laughs> Thanks, Mayor. Um, so, so, Debbie, I, I appreciate that. This seems like it's been a good partnership between the BBWA and, and us to kind of figure this out. But all we ever hear about the BBWA is the liability issues, the infrastructure issues, the you know the breaks and the the issues, you know, um, the leaks and all these kinds of things. And and the kind of um, even the winter scenario you described. We're going to take the existing water treatment pl plant down. We've got a month of water. Uh, during a time when we can't refill those reservoirs uh, reliably and, uh, you know, let's cross our fingers and everything's good. I don't know that I'm terribly comfortable with this. I like the, the cost savings, but um, how, how do I get comfortable with, with saying that, yeah, we're, we're getting into a, a good situation here. Does the city have liability now because we're putting an extra 30 CFS into the into the canal, um, and it's our water pressure that's that's causing other other breaks. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm not so sure that this sounds like a really great situation to jump in, despite the obvious financial savings. So many of the reasons that you just brought up there are why this wasn't our number one option. I mean, we wanted to have a lift station, a pump station, and taking a pipe. It's foolproof. We build it. It's new. It's going to last 40, 50 years. Um, so all those things you talk about are exactly why we ended up going the other direction. So a couple of things that I would say, um, we are going to be very careful that we don't own, operate, maintain any of this. So we are going to ask for water. They're going to put the water in their canal. By lining it, it means that they, one, will have less seepage, and two, they'll have the capacity to be able to carry our water. So their total conveyance will not go up. And as a side effect, they get more canal lined, which will have fewer uh, seepage issues. Um, as far as the concerns about maintenance and the facilities and that kind of thing, one of the nice things for them and us is this extra $150,000 they will get from us every year. Um, that will go directly into the operations and the repair and the work on those facilities. So in talking with the BBWA, that $150,000 will go, like I said, to line more places, to uh, work on some of those headgates, the flume, that sort of thing. So they need the cash frankly, is why they're considering this, and it will go directly to helping with some of those issues. Could you add a little bit about my concern in those conversations were the location. Mm -hmm. So in my moderately brief time, four and a half, five years working here, all, I think this is a, a correct statement, all of the issues we've dealt with have been east of 27th and that stretch of ground where the city owns quite a bit of property and the hill slot hillside is sliding this is literally miles to the west of that and so um, I would be much more nervous if we were <laughs> depending upon that stretch we're not depending upon that stretch at all I don't know what other issues maybe have come up relative to our concern about seepage or liability. I'm not aware of any in that stretch of from the river to where our reservoirs will be. And I, I would add, um, 
Yes, the inability to use it in the winter is a big concern. We, over this winter, we actually talked about days we would be able to run it. So if we have, and we typically do have that 40 degrees for an extended period of time, we have 74 CFS water rights, so we could fill it pretty fast. If we can run it for a few days, we'll be able to fill up anything we use. So it's not what we want, but we believe that we can make it work. So. Debbie, if I can follow up on that, I, I personally I'm not too worried about liability, although in that stretch that we're using it, because we would be involved in using it, it's a theoretical possibility. Um, when we look at this agreement, though, I would suggest that we look at uh, making sure that we understand how we can maintain our rights under this agreement if there's a change of ownership of the ditch. So the contract really needs to say, and I'm sure it does, that this is a covenant running with the land so that if a uh, uh, ditch company transfers to ditch company number two in the future, there's, ditch company number two is still bound by our agreement. That's fundamental. But also think through a little bit the process of a bankruptcy because it is a high risk proposition going through the largest city. Um, that's a real possibility. And bankruptcy courts typically have the power to abrogate contracts at which point we might, uh, if the uh, ditch company were taken over by a bunch of plaintiffs, what are our rights relative to that? We could have a big investment and then um, be over the barrel. So just something I don't know enough about. We should just think that through with uh, experienced bankruptcy counsel. Um, and I would say, and also consider whether there's an option for us to have some sort of a, uh, uh, an option to purchase if that would be more, um, uh, 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 bankruptcy worth so that we could make sure we could at least acquire that section of the right-of-way in a catastrophic event. So just some thoughts. Um, any other questions for um, back to Council Member Pearson? Just a quick follow-up with Tom's concerns because I've, I've thought of the same thing but you know with Chris bringing it up and you know the breaks have been further east so we're we're imagining the hundred year flood in downtown Billings with the complete collapse so what will that do for the west because that's where that water is supposed to be going so I just I, and and just to follow up on that so you know to answer that question but do we have in all of this I just feel like we have we don't have all the pros and cons I'm, I'm not sure that you know I know you guys have thought of it but I guess we need the confidence to know that you thought of everything too Okay, so uh, first we did a, a full study on different conveyance options and I'm happy to send that to the council. That was in 2018. Um, that was at a time we thought we could build all of this for the amount that we, we conveyed. Um, so when it, that study talks about the pros and cons of this and it walks through why we're not, why we didn't select it. So I'm happy to send that out. It was a, it was a solid study, it was extensive. Um, the second thing was the nice thing about this is it gives us the added protection of um, protecting our citizens if there is a breach or a full, um, you know, if there's a collapse of the tunnel and the water backs up, this allows us to take water off at the flume and it allows us to take water off here. So it takes 24 hours to turn that water off, but we would be able to take almost half of the water. Well, probably a third of the water um, between those locations. And that would save our citizens from basically that water coming into their areas. Thank you. Council Member Tiswell and <coughs> back to Council Member Joy. W, what, what part does the Canyon Creek flume play? And is, is it completely runoff if we, if we need it, or is it, is it a direct supply to us? It's the direct supply. So the main canal goes across the flume over Canyon Creek. Okay. And one more. Sure. And, and the city's going to put the bill for the entire repair or replacement of that flume? No. At this time, we're not looking at replacing the flume uh, completely, like I said, it's structurally sound. It needs some needs some work on uh, some of the wood structure, but uh, we don't believe it requires a full replacement at this time. Neither does the BBWA. It seems to me that the problems with that flume are specifically when we need it most in the winter. Mm -hmm. Is that am I correct? It. We won't run it when it would be a problem. So if it's freezing, like you saw in there, if it's cold enough to freeze the water, we won't be running it at that time. We'll wait until it gets, you know, 40 degrees and give us a few days to run it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Councilmember Joy. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council. I, 
This isn't a question. It's something floating in my head, and someday it will formulate. Um, so could you explain a little bit, maybe to me uh, for members of the council who may not have been here, when we really talked about what this plant does in terms of resilience for our supply of water across the whole city. Uh, I think, um, and I remember uh, some discussions where um, that seems really, really important. So maybe you could kind of speak to that. I mean, we, I, I always think, okay, you take water from one spot and then it's kind of in there. But how does this integrate our water infrastructure across the whole city in terms of redundancy and efficiencies? Thank you. So several times over the past few years, you've been aware of situations we've had where we've struggled to either meet the demands of the city or meet anything. Um, so last year we had the icing issue where we were seeing inches of water in the river flowing down. If we had the reservoir and the water plant on the other side of the, the city, we would be able to supply water to everybody throughout that whole time. Um, as it was, we made it through it. Uh, with storage reservoirs that we have finished water in the system, but we have a limited amount of time there. Um, anytime the river is impacted, we need this facility. So we've seen high water, we've seen the flood where we couldn't draw water, we've seen low water, we've seen an oil spill, um, and we've seen problems with our water plant itself. So we have so many areas of vulnerability right now uh, with the system we have, and this allows us to take care of most of those, um, what I would call the most uh, substantial vulnerabilities in our system. Okay, uh, Council, uh, Councilor Vitrici, and then we'll open up for public comment on this topic. Uh, Councilor Vitrici. Could you go back to the picture of the Canyon Creek flume in winter and talk to me why that shouldn't scare me? Uh, so, the flume, of course, the water runs above that. What you're seeing here is just the fact that a little bit of water drains through here all winter long, and it's cold, so it starts um, icing. In this case, they have those head gates, the gates on the side of the flume open. So they're kind of intending for that water to come out of the flume. So, so that's not like a new leak or something like that. That's actually a no. place where water is supposed to come out. Yeah, versus continuing down, it can come yeah. out here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's open it up for public comment. Uh, this uh, is your opportunity. If anybody would like to be heard on item number one, um, please come forward. Is there any public comment on item number one? Do not see any, so we'll close the public comment period. Uh, council, um, any final questions or direction for staff on this item? Council Member Ripses? Debbie, sorry, one more. I was just wondering what the impact on water rates would be if we did the $35 million intake and maintained our own stability. So when I was here, um, when we talked about our water rates a couple weeks ago, we talked about that $1 million a year extra would end up being uh, $3 for water. So for every million dollars, and Jennifer is going to scream at me tomorrow, so <laughs> sorry. Um, Jen can do these numbers much better than I can, but basically that extra million was $3 to every rate payer. Per so year or per month? Sorry. It was $3 per year. And that was the annual? That was the annual amount that it would... No, it's $3 per month. I'm sorry, it's $3 per month. Um, so that's the amount that would go up for a million. So if you're looking at $35 million, it's substantial. Of course, we would spread that over years um, right. by bonding it, but it's a substantial amount of money. All right, thank you. I will send you that answer though okay if that uh, then concludes item number uh, council member Gilles? just a, a comment I didn't have a question just I, I do applaud the innovative thinking that as, as council member Shaw mentioned I mean I it does seem to me to be a win-win because it does give more additional resources to BBWA so that they can help us avoid some other issues further down the line it, 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 it and it seems to me that um, there's going to be many more uh, opportunities slash necessities for the two organizations to be working together in the future. It's good to have a working relationship through this. So I, I anyhow, I think it's great that we had a study initially that looked at that. We have, were able to draw upon. Um, I, I do really appreciate uh, the innovative thinking here. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, that concludes then item number one. Item number two is the uh, budget overview for fiscal year 2024. 
our budget director, uh, uh, finance director, Andy Zeller, is our presenter. Andy. Could I just say, Mayor, as Andy gets ready to that on this prior item, I think it's good to consider both the worst case and best case. So I think you, the the record should show at some point the thirty five the thirty five million dollars in today's dollars will likely be a capital investment that we need to make, whether it's made ten years from now, twelve years from now, or needs to be made sooner, or maybe never. But the assumption should be at some point that option of conveying it through a pipe was the preferred method to, to ultimately do it. So thanks. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I think as we start our FY24 budget, um, I guess I, I want to have some kind of preliminary comments and then we'll get into it all. Uh, some of this we've gone through portions of it so far with the Budget and Finance Committee. So I'll give them opportunity to speak as well. Um, Chris and I are going to kind of switch on and off at different points here uh, as we move through. and. I think at, at this point we've got what we think is a good proposal and then there's certainly some issues that we really need some feedback and work through with you guys uh, just as we've had in years past um, on a few key issues. Um, certainly any of it is open for that discussion but there's some we definitely want to uh, focus on as well. Um, so I don't know if Chris or Jennifer, Councilmem I mean, Council Member Owen Boyette or Kulik would like to speak but I guess a piece I'll say will lead into, uh, I'm assuming, Ch Chairperson Owen's comments, which has been the advance, the change this year, which I think we're going, I hope we learn is advantageous that we've got the Budget and Finance Committee who's done work on this to help guide us and make a better set of proposals to you, uh, as well as, I think, a better understanding uh, amongst your peers in the process and and we certainly are still learning this is our first time through but uh, I think it provides us um, it's provided us with some really good dialogue between department directors the committee and administration and finance to frankly refine and be in a better position particularly as we go through the budget um, and, and, and I guess I would ask for some level of, of kind of grace and understanding that this first year, we're still learning it as we work our way through that. So maybe there'll be a point in a few years where, boy, when you see the recommended budget from administration, it's gotten a lot more refinement. We've had to do that really as we're moving along uh, with budget and finance. So with that, I would welcome anything that Councilmember Owen would like to add. Councilmember Owen. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chris. I guess I just wanted to um, give a little bit of, of context for what the work we've been doing in the Budget Committee and highlight a couple things that I hope we can all pay attention to over the coming weeks. Uh, the Budget Committee has, I think, had really productive conversations with um, some department directors so far. We'll continue to do that. Um, over the month of May, we've met with um, the folks working on New City Hall. We've met with police, fire, legal, and courts. We've done a lot of work with Public Works, and we think that'll continue um, with our next meetings. What we haven't done is tried to direct significant change to the content of the budget. That feels outside of our scope. So we've recommended areas where presentations could be more refined, where information seemed to be missing. We've indicated what we expect to be concerns based on what we've heard from colleagues so that department directors are prepared to answer them. Um, we did make some recommendations in how the budget message and presentation was crafted. Um, two that I want to highlight to your attention. The first is that, um, as usual, there's an indication of council priorities in the budget message. We asked that some dollars figures be attached to that. There are some significant policy decisions that have to get made over the coming weeks. And we wanted to get a sense of how well we as council are doing in aligning our resources to the priorities that we say we want to affect. So I appreciate seeing that in here. That was sort of a quick turnaround and I, I appreciate you doing that. We had also suggested that given the magnitude of the policy issues that we really do have to debate, that council might not need to see a department director presentation on every department. We have gone over all of the general fund administrative departments, HR, um, fleets, um, library, et cetera. Um, and 
if there weren't major changes in the budget amounts or major policy issues, we suggested that council members could review that in writing. Um, so that's our recommendation to you tonight. We have big issues that we need to deal with, and we'd like to see our council time, the public's time, taken up with those conversations rather than just sort of marching through everything. We told Andy to tell the department directors if they really wanted to come, they should. We didn't want them to feel they were being minimized. I think there were zero takers on that request. I'm here. Yeah, you're here. <laughs> and IT's here. But I'm coming to IT. That's going to make my list of issues. So um, you will see those in here. Obviously, if you have questions, email them. Ask Andy. He can report back. And if, if people want to see them, please don't let our committee recommendation trump council prerogative. But we think there's significant issues to focus on. A couple of those issues I want to highlight to your attention as we get in here. The biggest one is going to be what we do with mills versus the expected increase in property taxes due to reappraisal. They will be significant changes. They will create significant resources and they create significant hardship for citizens. So we're going to have to wrestle with that. We're going to have to wrestle with what that means in light of the settlement with what that means for the future of parks funding and parks maintenance um, and how we can best mitigate the what I think committee agrees are necessary increases in some of the fees and assessments for infrastructure against these um, pending tax increases and sort of where we want to set things. Um, and we need to do that in light of our priorities and whether or not we are really putting our money where our mouth is when it comes to taking action. To that end, we're going to have to wrestle with an overall strategy for public safety. Um, we have to decide what we're going to do with the two mill marijuana and opioid settlement money. The concern that we discussed at the committee level with a simple RFP process is there's no guardrails. There's no parameters for what we would want those people who might bid for those dollars to accomplish. And so at some point, council is going to have to start setting some general guides for what we want to see the public come to us and say we can do with a little bit of government funding. There are, as I think Andy will highlight, significant inflationary increases, insurance increases, increased audit costs. We've talked about those. So we're going to see administrative costs go up, um, which is never desirable. It's never great to see that. And I think it's important that we understand why those are happening and be able to talk about them. Um, on that same note, there continues to be, we hear it from department director and department director, we have IT issues. There are some infrastructure issues that we have to deal with. We heard it out of finance. We hear it from, we have this technology issue that somehow we have to grapple with um, and try to understand better. We will be asked to grapple with some labor shortages. Public Works will come with a proposal to shift away from seasonal workers into full-time FTEs. Raising FTEs when we're also seeing taxes go up is a hard thing to swallow. But we may have to have that same conversation in Parks and Recreation, whether or not they can sustain seasonal workers or if we have to move to a different model. Um, we will talk, and I think Ed has been a great champion for helping us understand deferred maintenance and infrastructure backlogs, and then our big projects, New City Hall and the West End Water Treatment Plant. So because of those, because of how big they are, we urge Andy and Chris to be streamlined in how we march through the next month of these um, work sessions. Um, so just, you know, please obviously ask us questions, um, ask Andy questions, but we have tried to look over every administrative budget that you may not see presenting tonight. Um, and Andy sent out his email already on the council amendment process, which we hope uh, will be productive and really encourage people to start thinking about those amendments now. At this time, the committee doesn't have proposed amendments, but I anticipate that we might. And individual committee members can also bring amendments as well. So that is where we stand. Our next meeting will be um, in on May 10th, and then we will meet again on May 24th. Um, so if council members have questions in advance of those, please let us know. I don't know, Mike or Ed, if I missed anything. No, okay, thank you. Well, I guess yeah. maybe Kessler, one thing I would uh, say is, is for Gilg. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, just just on on. Uh, thank you for addressing the the the, the deferred maintenance. Um, I appreciate that we have uh, a city administration that has um, making sure that we, as a council, as as a, as a community, really do address things that in the past just sort of kicked the can down the road in terms of, of deferred maintenance. It was the easy thing to do, and it costs us all more in the end. And so, um, you know, there are some things that we, we I think we should be addressing in terms of deferred maintenance so that we, we, the, the problem doesn't grow even greater. And and I appreciate uh, leadership of, of um, City Administrator Kukulski as, as, and, and the department heads for bringing those forward to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, just a reminder on the, pr the process uh, here, we have two special work sessions scheduled uh, uh, for Tuesday, uh, a week from tomorrow, so May 9th and then May 16th. Those are, the, at this point, the only two special meetings uh, devoted purely to um, uh, budget. 
Uh, Councilor Ripsis, did you have anything else on this topic? Or whoever else, who's our third? Uh, Mike. Uh, Councilor Boyette. Just that I was very pleased with Andy. Uh, he was willing to talk with us. I've, I've usually, in the last few years, I had to go down and, and, and make him get on the chalkboard and draw some diagrams to make it simpler. But that was one of our goals was, is how do you present this so that the average person on the street could say, I don't understand a word of this versus that really makes sense. And, and that was one of my goals was try to, to have it so that it, it was in plain English and uh, the deferred maintenance is amazing. The cost of insurance is outrageous. So um, hang on. And, and Andy, uh, you do a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, if, if your head isn't so big, Andy, then yeah, you can still I, talk to us. Please go ahead. I can't the door right now, so I'll yeah, okay. stick around. Go ahead. I don't know. Well, I think Chris is going to start us off. So with that. With the fact that his son hit an infield in in the park home run uh, here the last few days that it probably doesn't get much bigger than that so i've been bragging about it all week so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't t-ball yeah. but yeah we're not exactly yeah. we're not exactly in high school level yet either um but anyway so so what one of the starting points and and we don't want to belabor it but we don't want to lose sight of it right the prior year budget, the budget that we're in, there's been a number of things accomplished. So I just want to hit those briefly. Obviously, with the public safety levy, with uh, the voter support, which in some regards maybe feels just like yesterday or feels like years ago because it was back in 2021, the revenue actually started coming in in November of 2022. So just six, seven months ago, but you can see the, uh, you know, hiring 28 police officers, uh, running the changes, implementing the Center for Public Safety Management recommendations in police and fire uh, have been a substantial amount of work and effort. Um, the new city hall project, right? That has, uh, for, for Kevin, I, I, I he has been absolutely priceless in uh, helping and leading and guiding with his team that project. I have had to put very little time into that. That really has been on his shoulders and his team. But a significant uh, effort that uh, we hope many, many decades from now we, we won't have to be thinking about space like that. Um, the airport. Right, as you fly in and out of our airport now, we now have, I think, an airport that fairly represents uh, and recognizes the value and the interest of air transportation in the biggest city in this region of the country. Project is still underway, but five of those eight gates have opened. Um, both Skyline uh, and Skyview, or the inner belt loop, both, both those have broken ground. We are, uh, you know, weather dependent, but fully expect that in this construction season, the trail will be done if everything were to go absolutely perfect, possibly the road. So we're going to work towards that. I think realistically, Debbie and I had this conversation earlier, probably will be completed, opened up in 2024, but breaking ground on that, getting moving forward, contractors hired huge. Um, and then the number of meetings and engagements with our stakeholders across our community in both, uh, in this case what's listed is, is our parks, trails, recreation. If you remember the goals we adopted the prior year, it said we were going to spend a lot of time engaging the community and we did. Uh, and Councilmember Rupsis and several of you were involved and I thank uh, them for their leadership. Uh, similarly, I'm not sure, is there a, th this is the list? This is the okay. condensed list. The condensed slide. list. I just want to touch on one other because there were also several meetings along that same vein working with stakeholder partners on public safety and in particular crime prevention. So a number of partners from the school district in Riverstone and Rimrock uh, and others were involved in that same capacity as well. So um, I won't belabor it. 
uh, but it was a very, very significant budget that you adopted uh, just about a year ago. Um, very significant capital. That's where most of the reservoir project was at from a dollar standpoint. And um, it's nice for the public to be able to see that we put their dollars to use investing in the infrastructure that they own. So with that, I'll turn it over to Andy and he'll carry a fair amount of this going forward. All right. Thank you, Chris. So the way we'll kind of work through this is starting very high level and then kind of working into the parts into some detail and then kind of moving on from there. Um, so to start off, the proposed FY24 budget uh, estimates total revenue of around $336 million. Um, the largest portion of that being charges for services. We'll go through some of those in more detail, all these in more detail. And then taxes and intergovernmental, which are grants from either the state or the federal government. Um, and then special assessments and smaller from there. If you're looking at this slide from last year, our debt proceeds would have been substantially larger uh, because we had the West End Reservoir Project in last year. And you're going to see, when we look at some of the comparisons, you're going to see that it, there's a large change from last year, and it's almost significantly due to that. Total expenses at $370 million, almost $371 million for FY24, um, about a third capital third personal services and third O&M, a little bit of debt service. So this, this shows the kind of some historical budget comparison. On the far right is FY24, uh, broken apart by those same classes. And the gray area being capital. And you can see how yeah, our budget has come down from last year. And that's exclusively in the area of capital when, look, when comparing here. Um, we're closer to that FY 2021 dollar amount now, um, which I would say is more in line with historically where we've been. Um, o and M and personal services do have steady gradual increase and go through some of that as well. Debt service is about the same. It stays pretty constant a lot like your mortgage does year over year. So capital projects for FY 24, there's $100 million in the budget. Um, much of this, I, I think almost exclusively, was in the CIP. Um, there's $6.5 million in the South TIF fund for movement towards the multi-generational rec center. It is the only place in the budget that has anything for the rec center. Uh, because it was part of the CIP, there is nothing in the budget right now with respect to investments, additional investments in parks, rec, and trails. So um, just want you to be aware of that. Uh, $4 million in investments to parks and rec facilities. That's largely in PD-1, um, a little bit in the general fund, but I think mostly in, or in PD-1. $10 million at the airport. Um, $10 million combined, I'll say, downtown street conversion and improvements, as well as uh, improvements to unimproved streets, uh, gravel streets in the uh, South TIF, and then some other unimproved streets throughout the city as well. And then 25 million improvements to water and wastewater in, uh, infrastructure. Operations and maintenance, as, as I said earlier, makes up about a third of the budget. It's an $11 million increase over the prior year. Um, 3.5 million in water and wastewater maintenance services. I believe most of that is what Debbie just talked to you about with the BBWA canal, anticipating investment there. Um, as Councilmember Owen mentioned, our property and liability insurance has been going up quite a bit. Um, it's a $1 million increase over the prior year. Uh, we've been seeing double-digit increases in property and liability for the past few years. We've been hoping that that would slow down, um, but we, we really have to catch up because we've, we charge that to departments internally uh, based upon you know, their, their assets they have or you know, their FTEs in the case of liability. Uh, and, and so we, we really need to make sure we're catching up and staying current on that. Um, that's probably one of the largest increases, I think, throughout the whole budget uh, that affects all the departments. Uh, increases in utilities, electricity, and natural gas. Uh, we communicate with Northwestern Energy and MDU to get estimates on what we think we're going to see there. And you know, this is, we're at $1.4 million. And then another 650000 in broadly termed professional services. Um, our audit contract is up. 
we anticipate a pretty steep increase in that. Uh, th that is not exclusively for the audit, I'll be clear. Um, but that's one of the items we'll see a large increase in. Um, fewer, fewer auditors out there doing this work. Uh, there's more risk to them. That's just kind of, I, I think, been created through accounting pronouncements over time. And so we, we anticipate large increases there as well. Um, this shows the change in our tax base in yellow uh, compared to the change in CPI over the same time frame in red. And what you see here is our tax base is on that two-year reevaluation cycle. So we see those larger increases in the odd years and much smaller increases in the even years. And CPI over the past couple years, as you know, has been going up quite a bit. Um, and our historical tax base has not kept, kept up. We do anticipate a large increase in our tax base this fiscal year, or this coming fiscal year. Uh, presently, the DOR has given preliminary comments about Yellowstone County as a whole, and they're anticipating a 29% property increase, valuation increase in the county. Historically, we have lagged behind the county, um, mostly due to the fact that refineries are not included in the city and they're a large tax base driver. But we don't lag that far behind. Um, we'll go through some of my projections and what we think we'll see here uh, going forward. Um, so personal services, which it makes up all your staffing, uh, salaries, wages, benefits. $5.8 million increase, it's 5.3%. This includes contracted salary increases as well as additional staffing requests. Um, the additional staffing requests make up about 1.2 million of that 5.8. Andy, can I go back to the prior slide just in case somebody was watching and stopped listening once they heard that their taxes were going to go up between 29 and 19 percent? Andy is exactly right that that's the estimate that the taxable value is expected to go up. This budget is put together closer to a 6 percent increase dealing with inflation and other things. So um, in case you tuned out, <laughs> threw something at the television, decided you were done, <laughs> and not to say six isn't real, it is real as well, and we've debated it at length, but I don't want anyone thinking what's being presented throughout the night tonight is, is a 20% increase because taxable values may be going up 20%. So sorry, Andy, That's thank right. you. Thank you. It's good to catch it now. So, <laughs> all right. So the the FTE requests. These are additional FTEs. Um, there are fifteen total. Three of them are still related to the public safety mill levy. Those are the three municipal court positions. Um, it's adding the full time judge and two uh, assistant positions. We did add one court position a year ago to start getting that person trained and ramped up, um, but these would be the three remaining ones. Uh, the, let's see, libraries requesting a facilities position, which is new, and the security position, they currently have contracted security. Uh, they're requesting to go to uh, basically moving away from that model of a contracted service and, and hiring the, um, the, the positions in-house. An additional position in facilities as well as the airport. And then some additional uh, positions at Public Works. These are to handle, uh, I guess, additional needs at, at the landfill as well as uh, collection routes. These do not show the, the, the numbers up there do not include the seasonal positions that were converted to FTEs, which I believe Public Works came and spoke about and then uh, Councilmember Owen mentioned as well. So going into the revenues, again, the $336 million in revenue to fund this uh, FY24 budget. Charges for services, uh, these consist of external users and internal users. External users are largely water and wastewater, solid waste, and airport. These are fees collected from uh, users of these services. Internal users are uh, IT services and fleet, our health insurance fund, um, all those internal services that we allocate out to, uh, to internal departments for the services we provide them. That makes up $139 million. Tax revenue, so here's back to what Chris and I were saying. So we are anticipating 
the, the estimate I have is 19% based upon what we've seen residential value in the city do, as well as some kind of assumptions on uh, corporate tax, or uh, sorry, commercial property, and then some other kind of tax classes. We built the budget assuming a, generally a 6% increase in tax revenue though. So what that would mean is while values go up somewhere between 19, let's call it 20 and 30%, depending on where the DOR is compared to where I'm guessing um, or estimating, we, we are building this budget based upon revenue of, tax revenue of $59 million. So what that means is in, in August, we'll receive that actual value from the Department of Revenue. At that point, we'll come back to council and based upon whatever budget is adopted, assuming this is what was adopted, we would bring mills to you that would generate $59 million. Um, that $2.9 million increase over the prior year, um, I believe calculates out higher than 6%, but that includes the tax increment districts, that includes the planning, Tax, the tra tax revenue from the county that comes over, as well as the tax revenue from the <coughs> library. Actually, I don't know that that's on there. I believe, I believe that's not reflected there, sorry. Um, so it does calculate out a little bit higher, but, but to the overall homeowner, it should be approximately a 6% increase, assuming their value went up consistent with the whole county. And, and Andy, just for clarification, the 19% number <coughs> is based on um, uh, taxable value at the last reappraisal cycle, which would be two years before, not just last year, correct? So if somebody says, well, my property didn't go up 19% last year, that's correct. Uh, we're looking at a two-year time span for that number. Is that a correct statement? Yes, that, that is correct. Um, the reappraisals happen in odd number of years, 2023, here we are. The last one was in 2021. So the value that you have on your tax statement today is the value of your home on January 1 of 2020. Your new value that you'll receive notice in, I believe, July, perhaps late June, will be the value of your home on January 1, 2022. That's the time frame that we're working in. Okay, thank you. Yep. The next portion, intergovernmental revenue, we get largely it comes from the state and the federal government. The state consists mostly of entitlement share. Uh, entitlement share are taxes collected for gaming, alcohol, aircraft registration, a few combination of fees and taxes that the state collects. And then they redistribute to the cities. Um, that generally has about a 3%, 4% increase year over year. And we're estimating that to be about 17.5 million. And outside of some changes that will occur at the legislature, that number's very accurate. They give us that ahead of time. Um, there is some indication that that may go up uh, due to some changes they've made, but I, I don't think it'll be less than that. The other blue line are kind of other, other intergovernment revenue. So the, the 911 fees that we collect, gas tax fees we collect. Um, we receive them from the state. They're reflected in intergovernmental revenue, and that's that blue line. The intergovernmental revenue from the federal government is declining quite a bit. Um, this is based upon the, I'll say, usage, elimination of uh, CARES Act dollars and American Rescue Plan dollars primarily. We, we are still, you know, we're getting back down to that, I'll say, pre-COVID federal funding um, amounts. And uh, I would, barring any, uh, I don't know, any unforeseen Funding situations from the federal government, I think this is probably closer to where we'll be on an annual basis. The, the water department, I think, is the only one in there that still is showing, well, probably still in airport and transit as well, showing some of those ARPA dollars as they receive some of those to the FAA, FTA, and um, then the water department's getting some ARPA as well. So into the general and public safety funds combined. So as you know, we receive funding direct for public safety fund and funding direct for our general fund. The public safety revenue is not enough to cover the expenses in the public safety fund. There's a substantial transfer from the general fund into the public safety fund. For 
this kind of portion. We, we pull out that transfer. They're largely interdependent upon each other from a financial perspective. So that's what you're seeing here. Um, police and fire making up the majority of these expenses. This is generally the services provided by general funds at most cities. The reason we have them separate is because we have those dedicated mill levies. So you see fire and police make up you know, 75% of that total portion, and then parks 7%, and then the remainder from, um, I'll say, kind of administration type services as well as legal and court. Uh, here it is in dollars comparing the prior year. So 72 million last year, 75.7 million dollars this year. Um, there it is by, by fund, comparing just general fund and public safety, uh, what we're proposing. The transfers out here in these funds that remain are transfers to the equipment replacement plan for police and fire and then a little bit for parks. Uh, and then transfers to uh, some debt service for um, the BOC debt, which is in its final year here. And then um, the transfer from the general fund to the library per our interlocal agreement. So that's what's that 1.8 million in the general fund is largely the transfer to the library fund. This slide we've used in the past to show uh, revenue and expenses and fund balance as well as recommended minimum. So we'll walk through this one a little bit slower because I think there's a lot there. Uh, the red line across the top, sorry for people who may be colorblind, this will be challenging, but it's got the circles in it. Uh, that, that line is our budgeted expenses. Well, it's, it's actual for the prior years, estimated for 23 and budget for 24. And then the green line with the squares in it is our projected revenue. In 2018, uh, or in, in 2019 rather, we stopped collecting the franchise fee. That was the uh, decline. And then through 2020, 21, uh, and into the future, we had increases in our, um, uh, through CARES Act, and then also the public safety levy. That's what drove those increases. And then you see the increase from 23 to 24, uh, largely predicated upon the um, increase in property taxes of 6%. The expenses uh, go up quite a bit in 22. That was to purchase the new city hall building and begin uh, some work on that. Uh, we, we transferred that money out of the general fund. That's why the green bar goes way down. The green bar is our fund balance in the general fund. We took it all the way down to our recommended minimum reserve and Estimations right now uh, for 2023 is we'll potentially add the same million and a half to two and a half million to our reserves, um, largely just in unspent funds from fiscal 23. Fiscal 24 is a balanced budget with respect to revenue and expenses. We are not recommending using any reserves presently in 24. That may change, obviously, through some discussion with council as well. So you don't see the fund balance change from 23 estimate to 24. <clears throat> what I have here, I think is probably a little confusing, but um, because of all the wild changes or large changes in property tax values, um, we want to try to portray what, what does the recommended budget mean to impact to homeowners? Currently, we don't have all the monthly utility bill information. There's some solid waste uh, rates that are forthcoming. That'll all be uh, presented at the May 15th work session. But what we know for property taxes and uh, assessments are generally, what our recommendation is, is that you keep your public safety mill levy at the max of 114. The reason that for that is as I said earlier, the, the revenue from that tax does not cover the expenses. So we're recommending keeping it at the max, which would be a 29% or 19 to 29% increase for that line, but then offset with a substantial reduction in the general fund mill levy because there's not that need for that transfer to the public safety fund given the large increase in revenue. Um, and then additionally, a reduction in library transit and general obligation mills, uh, those are those would generate about, I, I think, about 5% additional revenue for library and transit. It, it does 
give the departments, the council, capacity in the future should we not see growth keeping up with inflation to, you know, kind of capture some of that in the future. In real dollars, what I've done here, so that last year the current median home was 228000 Today, current valuations that have not been updated, the median home is two hundred thirty one. If I showed you 231 up there and compared it to the prior year, it would make it look like taxes are going down. It would be very disingenuous. So I took 231, grossed it up 19% to get to 277,800 to show if the 19% increase happens and you set those mills at 184.53, what would that homeowner see in respect to increases? And, and again, Andy, so the date of that 20, 277800 would be uh, January 1 of 2022? Correct. Correct. Thank you. Overall, that's a $61 per year increase on their property tax statement. 42 of that from property taxes, and then 18 or 19 for the assessments, which are Park District 1. We're recommending an increase of 5.7, street maintenance, and storm sewer. If, well, I'll say when property taxes values come back at something different than 19%. As I said earlier, we will bring a recommendation to set mills that are probably not 184.53, but something different that generates about 6% more tax revenue in the city. <coughs> Park District 1 is set on taxable value, so that would, that would see an adjustment as well. Storm sewer and street maintenance are not set on a taxable valuation, so those numbers are probably more firm or accurate. Turn back to Chris. I think there's two sides there. Oh, great, thanks. So as we look at the proposed budget, and please again recognize these are generalizations, but putting dollars to the specific goals and strategies, um, and these are not increases, these are the dollars. So of that overall um, budget, you got essentially uh, just shy of $66 million going into public safety, direct public safety. Um, and these uh, includes operations of police and fire. You saw that was 74%. When you combine general fund and public safety funds, 74% of those dollars go into those two areas. Some of the increases you see, safe routes to schools, um, traffic calming, some of this smaller by dollar figures, but notable uh, pro programs. On core infrastructure, you see uh, just north of 77 million, the, the airport terminal project. Um, I think technically we're in phase three right now. The anticipation is in uh, early, mid 2024 that this component of the project will be complete. Um, and uh, you see the others there. Um, we have the reconstruction of the work downtown with uh, our chip seal. And while doing that chip seal and that maintenance work, that's the time to do the, the one-way conversions. And also significant investments in water, wastewater, uh, main replacements under the ground. Every year we want to be doing several million dollars. If you recall, this is an area that we have some work to do, right? We know. Um, Today, we're expecting a pipe from a financial standpoint. We're expecting a pipe to last something like 175 years. And we know a pipe won't last 175 years. It's much closer to 100. So we've got a you know, strategy to increase those annual investments and then also uh, wastewater and Monad Road. I don't know if I'm pointing in the right direction. There we go. So on uh, the parks, trails, recreation, cultural investments, I think you're seeing a, a significant number there. And 
tied to the multi-generational rec center is certainly a significant piece of that, as well as uh, Castle Rock Park, Centennial Park, all the things that are in the capital improvement plan. Andy, do you want to touch on, can you remind us how the multi-generational rec center is viewed in this regard? In the, in the budget? Yeah. Yeah, so as I said, the presently in the FY24 CIP, and then consequently the budget, the first portion uh, was projected to be funded at 6.5 million through a uh, bond issue from the South TIF. Then the remainder of all of it would happen in FY25, all assuming there would be a vote on that project. Obviously the FY25 stuff is not in here. None of the parks investments are in here. It was kind of projected that they would happen in FY25 or later. Um, but that 6.5 million is in here. If you were to adopt this budget tonight and we moved forward, there are many council action items that would come before you, before we'd issue debt, before we'd enter into a contract, select bids. I mean, that there's a lot of process that has to happen there still. Um, but currently, the only thing in there for that project is 6.5 million in the South TIF fund. So at the risk of asking out loud, how do we get to $192 million? Does it not include the 115 rec center? I'm assuming the full rec not, center I, is showing up there a good question, as, as a debt. I'll get more detail for you. 19.2. <laughs> um, <'cause, laughs> so. It's missing a decimal. Oh, yeah. You, someone deleted the decimal point off. Okay, thank you. 19.2, thank you. That's the one I did. No. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Council Marowan. Um, improving the built environment. So uh, uh, you, we talked a little bit about the, the maintenance project downtown, the two-way conversions, and uh, relatively small by dollars, uh, but just shy of $100,000 into the organizational side, which specifically is, is a software investment. Um, our software that we use for our record system and what we had hoped to use into the future for our record system is unfortunately panning out like too many things these days. When it's too good to be true on what the offer is and the proposal is from whomever, I won't disparage certain industries, you find out, you know, it just doesn't do quite what you needed to. So as as the clerk's office is the responsible party for the record system across this organization. And in 2023, and well before 2023, people expect to be able to go online and gain access to public records in a simple, straightforward way. This is a pretty small investment relative to what needs to happen there. So you got some changes there. Is that it? I think the next one's yours too. Okay. Let's see if I'm aiming up high enough here. There we go. So some decisions that aren't tonight. Um, the Budget Finance Committee and staff still have some work to do here, but we thought it was important to kind of plant these seeds and know that we're thinking about them and you'll need to be thinking about them. Um, what to do relative to the parks, recreation, public lands, trails, conversation, uh, bond or levy spent Friday of our retreat focused on that issue. I uh, want to thank um, each of you have been asked from each ward to further refine and we had a meeting uh, before we started tonight on that working with city administration on how to take all the work that we've been doing over the past 12 months with the community and really drill into what will be the recommendation from your peers to this table as to what to do uh, whether it's both a bond and a levy or neither or one or the other. Um, mental health and substance abuse investments. We, as you will recall, in the public safety levy uh, educational campaign, we were very clear that we were committing uh, two mills, a minimum of two mills to substance abuse, mental health, trying to get upstream. We spent um, our full second day of the retreat really focused on uh, crime prevention uh, and in this area. So uh, there is still more work to do here. 
for some, I worry they may get frustrated or have become with why is it taking us so long? And yet at the same time, I would say what we're learning and the flexibility we still retain because we didn't lock into things a year ago that were multi-year commitments, I think allow us to frankly direct those dollars much more in line with what we talked about at the retreat and ultimately how you direct. Those decisions will still be made. Um, Councilmember Owen again mentioned earlier some sideboard uh, components, whether we want to do RFPs or whether we actually want to um, work directly with particular partners that are targeted at specific outcomes that we're looking for, particular areas. We've got land use planning that I think is changing in two capacities. The first one, um, Billings is seeing growth pressures that it hasn't seen in several decades. We've always, for 50, 60 plus years, maybe that's not always, but the better part of a century, we've enjoyed a slow, steady growth pattern of 1% plus or minus. Post-COVID, that's no longer the case. And, and I think our public is expecting and they get most frustrated if we're not well planned in what's happening around us. There's a lot of stress around those issues. And so I think we need to talk about some further investments there if our taxable value turns out to be as strong as we think it may. And then secondly, the legislature, if it stays on the path it is, it has dramatically changed the process by which land use decisions will be made in the future and it puts a much much heavier emphasis on the necessity and the importance of what was referred to as a growth policy and so uh, in the past uh, many communities including I think Billings could look at the growth policy as quite aspirational but the real tough decisions got made when you had subdivisions in front of you when you looked at your neighborhood plans. With what the legislature has passed so far, the growth policy of the future will be prescriptive. And developments that are consistent with that plan will very much have the green light to build and build as quickly as the economy uh, and the system will allow them to. That being said, we will need to take much more seriously, candidly, the investments we make and the engagement we make with our 120,000 citizens on what that should look like. And last but not least, at our final action meeting here in May, you will be going over, the public will be seeing and ought be making public comment on the franchise fee settlement, which is, uh, you know, sizable. So all three, all four of these are just a few areas, but I think very big picture areas that will alter what we've got presented to you as the recommended budget tonight. That'll be changes between the recommended budget from city administration to what you ultimately hopefully adopt in, in, uh, in June. And is that probably? I think that's it, Mayor, if I may. This is great. Uh, just a kind of few procedural comments as we move forward and some information for you as well. Um, you've got my email on the recommended amendment process uh, similar to last year. If you go in there and it doesn't work, you can't get into yours, please let me know. I think I got all the permissions set up correctly, but um, they are viewable to, we can't set it out for the public. It doesn't, you have to have a at Billings MT email, so anyone can view them, um, but you should be the only one able to edit your own. Um, we will bring them to one of these work sessions, I'm guessing June 5th. So what is in there at that point, we'll package them up, have them part of the council memo. They'll be public for everybody at that point. Um, certainly if the public requests to see them in the meantime, that as well is available to them. Um, questions and answers, as in years past, uh, you know, there are questions brought by council that either the, the person with the answer isn't here or we have to go back and get information. I'm trying to track those very closely and then in the weekly report, uh, weekly uh, newsletter, you'll have kind of an update on here's the questions and answers that you guys were wondering about. So same as past 
practice there. And I do have some printed budget books. And I know Councilman Boyette wants one, but uh, if anybody else wants one, I will make sure and bring them for you, perhaps this evening if there's not too many of you, but at a minimum next week. So um, let me know. I do have some printed books for you. Um, I think that's all I had for kind of, oh yeah, the, the work sessions are up there, May 9th, May 15th, May 16th, and June 5th, so mark those in your calendar. And I think that's all we have, Mayor. Okay, thank you, Andy. Excellent presentation, great overview, uh, very, very valuable. Thank you, uh, Budget Committee, for your, your work on this. The decisions for Council that were in that last slide were or two slides back or long term and significant, but not for tonight. Um, let's just go straight to public comment and then we'll come back to council if there's any other wrap up. We still have a significant item to get into the um, specific budget presentations on our three TIF districts tonight. But uh, if anybody would like to be heard on item number two, the overview of the budget that you just heard, please come forward just as usual. Please keep your comments to three minutes and tell us your name and address. Any public comment on item number two? No one is coming forward here and there's no one online, so we will close the public comment period. Uh, council, are there any questions for staff? Uh, uh, anything else? Council Member Joy. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Director Zeller, I have a question about, so I'm very um, thinking about constituents and they tell me, um, Taxes, taxes, taxes. Forty-two percent of our funding for our budget comes from fees. Where do the stormwater uh, street maintenance fees do they? Number one, do they appear on people's um, taxes when they get their little statement in the mail? And number two, where do they appear in the budget as a funding source that's fee-based or a funding source that's tax-based? Because I think this is a, a critical and important issue that many people don't realize when they get their tax, uh, tax statement. So I just wanted to be um, asked that for clarification. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Council Member Joy, they Specifically, the street maintenance and storm sewer do show up on people's property tax bill. They are an assessment which can be assessed via a variety of methods. One of them is taxable value. Some of them are square footage of the parcel um, or a combination of zoning usage, uh, traffic counts, things like that. So they do show up on the tax bill. However, in the overall pie chart, they are a special assessment. They make up that 10% kind of reddish orange pie wedge there. Uh, special assessments include Park District 1, Storm, Street, uh, SIDs, and PMDs primarily. There's probably a couple other ones I'm forgetting, but yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I might be cheating. Maybe it's not a follow-up question. <laughs> um, when you look at uh, charges for services, um, I can't think of the name that you use on your slide, between external and internal, those being um, what departments are charging each other for services. Of that internal, internal users, um, charges for service, how much of that comes from property tax? So general fund, you know, IT, where in that internal user charges for service, what percentage or what part of that comes from actual property, that 20% property tax? Thank you. That is a question I'll have to do some research on. Um, generally, the way these work, so take, I think Fleet's a good example. They'll work on all of the fleet vehicles at the city. So they they have, uh, it's up there as motor pool, but 2.3 million in revenue charged for services. It's all internal. Um, some of that is to solid waste who generates the revenue from charge for services. But some of that is to the police department or the parks department, mm -hmm. which is funded by tax revenue. Um, I'll have to, like I said, do some research to kind of break that apart and see what portion of those departments goes to charge for services internal, but um, I will have that for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Owen? Thank you, Mayor. 
Andy, we talked a little bit about trying to show council and the public how we're aligning expenditures with priorities, with policy priorities for the community. And so you've indicated here in one of these charts those numbers, right, those allocations. And they total, if I do my math right, about $168 million, which leaves about $200 million of the budget that doesn't seem to fit into a policy category, which I think is either not right or we have a significant misalignment. Which one do you think it is? <laughs> I was waiting for the question <laughs> while I was thinking of an answer. Um, so admittedly, I, I, I took my best stab at this. Sure. Um, I'm going to the end where these are. And uh, tried to read through kind of the sub-bullets of your priorities and, and capture the items that were within those areas. Um, I did not make attempts for, say, the finance department. None of that is projected in here. HR, none of that is in here. Um, where does, say, the, the, the personal services for our solid waste division, right? That probably not projected in here anywhere. Sure. Um, I, I really tried to tie it to what I thought I could stand up here truly and defend and not, not just give you a bunch of fluff. Um, but yeah, it was, that's probably where a lot of those elements lie. Um, and I think we talked about that in budget committees. We don't want to see you sort of make an argument that everything hitches its wagon to a core priority, because it probably doesn't. But I think it's just worth noting that either we've missed some significant things or there really is a pretty large misalignment if close to, you know, 60% of the budget isn't aligning with a critical priority. I think if Chris took a gloss at it, he might be a little less technical in his assessment yeah, but I, again I don't I don't want us to inflate numbers right just for the sure. the point of look but I do think we need to be conscientious of the fact that either there's a different assessment here or there's a significant portion of the budget that isn't being spent according to a critical priority in infrastructure has got to be the I, big I'm sorry what did somebody sorry. want to respond to that or I, I mean I guess my comment is how we define our priorities we've we've, we've defined them based on importance like what's in the front page which is often crime mm -hmm. And also then what we have um, budget shortfalls on that we know we have to dig into. Um, parks, jump to uh, I, I, there. Uh, but uh, if all of a sudden we stopped um, water, uh, <laughs> that would become a very high priority, but it really hasn't been a focus because we both have a funding source and the system seems to be working. Okay. It'll, it'll never be a one-to-one, -one, right? We're not going to see everything fit in a category. It's just worth as sort of a metric assessing where we're putting our money. A a absolutely. And i got to believe a very significant part of it's got to fall in the infrastructure <laughs> area, right? I mean, that is that is where most of the money, the most of the revenue comes from as well as most of the expenditures across the total budget are in core infrastructure utility areas. Okay, thank you. Councilmember uh, Gulick, Purrington, and Ripsis? Yeah, I guess I was going to say as much. I mean, street sweeping is not in there. You know, uh, just operations for all of the water treatment plant and, and th those are re replacements of systems but not um, just regular operations uh, of parks those kinds of things. Does that seem, sound right? I think so. I think you should just add in 192 instead of 19.2, and we'll get a lot closer. Yeah. <laughs> Councilmember uh, Pearson? Thank you. Yeah, because I was especially improve the safety of buildings, and it's you know, almost $66 million, but all you have on there is safe routes to schools and uh, traffic calming measures, and we talked so much more about some of the things that we felt like we needed to do in safety for billing. So, yeah, I, I can see that it's very generalized, but um, it'd be interesting to see that breakdown too. Not today. So the questions that I had was, um, so the crew funds that were in last year's budgets, the budget, and st we still have an implemented crew. And, um, and I know we're waiting on things and whatever, but those funds that were allocated for crew this past year, where are those funds going to go? So they will stay. So if you recall a year ago, we, that, that commitment of the two mills right. means that that two mills stays in that. We created a fund, and then what doesn't get spent stays in that fund. So... Excellent example, crisis response units still, still aren't rolling yet. We're working through that in negotiations. None of that money will slide over to the general fund reserve. It'll stay in the... Four crews. Four, well, 
Now for crew, it'll stay in the prevention, the two mil commitment that we made for um, mental health, substance abuse area. Okay, so that kind of brings up the other question is on at one point we were saying marijuana money, then we talked two mills. So there's two different funds there. And I'm not sure that we've got any sort of uh, dedicated funds for that marijuana. And then our 2% mills, uh, the projection of what that will be, and if there's something else that we're going to do. So I, I, I haven't seen those, but there may be more in the specifics later on. Yeah, so I can shed some light on that. Um, the, the budget anticipates having crew running and coming from the fund for public, or it's public safety, mental health, and substance abuse. If you, and I don't know the page number, but if you found the public safety fund in your budget book, there's a portion at the bottom that identifies the, uh, those funding sources, which come from the combined mill levy, some of the marijuana tax revenue, and then the opioid settlement revenue. Some of the marijuana money, as you recall, uh, was recommended. You guys approved the funding plan for the new city hall. A portion of that goes to fund that. So then the remainder goes into this pot. Um, the, let me pull that up so I have it exactly. Isn't that opioids money in jeopardy? I mean, is there still hashing it out nationwide? Did I see that today in the paper? I, I don't, not that I'm aware of. We have received some funds already, about 65, 70,000 this year. Okay. It, it, I don't know what future funding source, what future dollar amounts will be, but I, I believe it's about the next 18 years we should be getting some funding for that. It, it's not a significant portion, though. Um, the piece I would add is Andy's pull, or pulling it up. Budget and finance, there's still some policy issues to work through there. And budget and finance talked about it at length at the last meeting. And so I don't, I, I want to recognize that in my statements are going to be general. We, we, well, how I approached it last year and how it's presented this year is to keep separate the two mills for obvious reasons. We were very clear with the public that we were going to dedicate those two mills to upstream prevention. We also talked about and didn't didn't have uh, you know, the, that the three percent the local option marijuana tax would be something that we also would work really hard not work hard. We wouldn't just put it in the general fund to go wherever that it would go into prevention. But as Andy said, we did make part of how we resolved our financial challenge with City Hall is we made a five-year commitment, I think, to use uh, some of those some of those dollars. The remainder, I'd like to see stay in the prevention area. And then it wasn't a discussion a year ago that I recall, um, but in this current fiscal year, we have learned that the opioid money, that we are receiving opioid dollars, and those are being, and those have some limitations to them. They have to be spent on uh, some areas like this pot that we're talking about. So in the end, ultimately, whether all three, how we treat them, I want it, my advice is that we keep them so that they don't just get lost with the overall ge general fund. And the committee is very committed to that as well, especially those two mills that we were so explicit with the community how we would use those. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn it to Councilor Ripsis, but before I forget on that one, I just want to sort of state for the record, um, uh, when it comes to those two mills, when I was talking to the public, I never limited those to substance abuse and mental health. The way I always presented it was those, those two mills would be preserved for addressing the root causes of crime, in particular, substance abuse and mental health. Uh, but in my book, uh, and still today, I always uh, want to leave some flexibility for something beyond substance abuse and mental health, in particular, um, uh, studies of our uh, uh, overtaxed criminal justice system, our uh, need for uh, jail capacity, other things like that, that uh, in my book at least are uh, part of the root cause of crime. So, 
Councilmember Baripsis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to tag on to that, Andy, I expected to see like a section in that special revenue funds uh, part of the budget, uh, a new column for this this account that we're talking about, and and I didn't see that. So, you know, I think we just have to be very clear and transparent about what's going into that. And even if we've said, okay, well, we're going to spend some of it on City Hall or whatever, we got to see that the revenue went into there and then it's being taken out for, for whatever. So I, but that, um, that was my thought on that. Um, I didn't know that we were getting into that tonight, but yeah. Um, the, the one thing I wanted to say, though, is every time I open a budget document, they're like, there are always three numbers that I want to know. Um, what's the median property value? How much does one mill raise? And how much does one mill cost the median homeowner? And different budget documents over the years, some of them say that information, some of them don't. Some of them you can kind of figure it out from what's presented, but I think it'd be really helpful if just every year in the budget, those three numbers were explicitly laid out there. It's, um, so that would be helpful. Okay, can I <laughs> sure. respond a little bit to that? Yeah. Okay, so on the, the mental health substance abuse, because it is part of the public safety levy, it is in your public safety fund for budget and reporting. For accounting, we have a separate fund set aside for those specific dollars. So I can pull that up and I'll, at the recommendation of the finance budget and finance committee as well as you guys, I'll, I'll bring that forward you, for you or, or have some of that. Um, the, the current budget, I'm sorry, the proposed budget in front of you has crew in there at approximately total well, let's see, what is that? Uh, total cost at around $225,000. There is $625,000, I think it's probably, should be closer to $700,000 that is plugged in there as a budget authority amount, but with no, no real direction. And that's, that's the number that we're saying, hey, we're recommending doing crew, obviously, but what do you guys want to do with these funds? So you should be thinking about that six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollar amount. But I'll I'll try to put that together in a chart for you that I think makes sense, and I'll show some of what we've done this fiscal year. Um, we have uh, my my estimation is we're going to end the fiscal year with about one hundred and fifty to one hundred and eighty thousand dollars remaining in that fund in unspent funds. Uh, there's still the final bill from. Um, the low barrier shelter to come in, and I don't know what those costs will be, but there'll be some variable there. Um, with respect to your one mil, one mil will generate in the budget, we're estimating $265,000 per mil. It'll cost the, well, the median home I projected at what, two, 277,800. That's, that's a guess based upon that 19% increase of what it is today. And then that cost, I believe, on that home is uh, $3.75 per mil. Thank you. Uh, anything else for Andy? Uh, Council Member Nice? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Andy, uh, thanks for the presentation. And um, there's been a lot of good conversation here, but I, I'm, I am a little disappointed. That I'm, I, I'm, the first thing I look at is in a budget. Uh, similar to uh, Councilman Rupes, so we're looking for certain things in a budget to see, you know, where what's going on with the budget. And one of the things I've asked for in the past is, you know, what what percent of changes year over year. And I see the dollar amount, but it doesn't. And I've got to do the math to see wh which departments are higher or lower, um, and really where that budget, that six percent you're talking about, um, is coming from. And so when I look at um, just the section of the, uh, you can look at the 24 proposed general and public safety funds if you want to go to that slide. Uh, and I look at those numbers, and um, you, again, I'm looking at a, I'm th expecting a 6% average is because of what you're is telling me. Am I correct on that? In property taxes, correct. Okay, so what is the budget increasing and the average? Um, what's the budget increasing? Yeah, six expenditures. 3.5 million. Okay, so, so is that, so you're not, so you're saying the revenue is going to inc increase, but we're, I'm, I guess I'm a little lost on what you're trying to, what you're increasing the expenditures on then. Is that the 6% or you're just in, anticipating the revenue to 
it grows six percent, so that's what you're spending. So it t seems to me like your expenditures are going to match your revenue. Is that what you're so, indicating? So yes, we're projecting that revenue, tax revenue, will grow six percent. Um, other revenue, like our entitlement share, which funds a substantial portion of general fund and public safety, will be at that four four percent. Um, so total increase though is three point five million, and that's a little less than 5% there. Okay. So I'll get back to my original question because I like to look at what the departments are doing individually. And so I ran some quick numbers here and overall is 4.9% for this particular section we're looking at. And then I see mayor and council up 12.77. Why is that? I, I, you know, those, those are things I'm assuming are going to be in the, in the budget book when we get them and explain some of those questions as far as why. I look at the non-debt departmental 20.20 percent. I see code enforcement decreasing, you know, 3.86 percent. So those are those are concerns of that. You know, again, I'd like to see code enforcement do some things, and you know, we're decreasing some of the budget there. And and so we haven't gotten to the why of some of this, but I am concerned that when I look at these budget, you know, right off the bat, I can't quite tell you know what the percentages are. So I'd like to see that kind of in, included in some of these departmental numbers that we're looking at. You know, how, what percentage year over year they're actually increasing or decreasing, and then some of that why they're doing what they're doing. Um, I don't know if you can, that's something you can talk to them to get those numbers, or are we going to have to just do the manual numbers every time we, we look at the budget? So every departmental overview has the net change in their budget. Should, not all of them do, but should have some explanation on why. Um, but, and just to be clarified, when you say net increase, because uh, I agree completely with Councilor Bernice, is it in percentage terms as well as dollar terms? It is, it is not in percentage terms. I think that's his point. Right. It's just a good shorthand that allows us to compare whether that's uh, above average or below average, or, you know, completely, it justifies a good question, you know. Okay. Merritt, I have a, another um, question, if you don't mind. Please. Maybe it's not my question. It's just a point. Uh, we're talking about the public safety mill do uh, dollars, two mills and stuff. And I, I, I think I had, had argued that we, as a council, make sure we have a good resolution on those two mills, set them aside to make sure we understand how they're going to spend them. And last year we were talking about, well, should we, should we assess them or not? Because, you know, if we don't assess them, um, you know, now then we won't have the money and then we, you know, we're going to, and then we're going to get a program going and then we won't have the money to spend it on. Here it is already next budget cycle and we're talking about the fact that we've already assessed them we've collected the money we haven't got a plan yet to spend them and I think that we need to to um, really work on we've talked about this plan we really need to not assess these things these these mills if we don't have a plan hammered out by the council as far as what to do and if we have to do an interim uh, you know where you have to assess the mills later on or something they wait a whole nother year but I think we need to really put that as a priority to get that plan in place. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't support raising those two mills, uh, part of that public safety mill, until we have some kind of plan uh, hammered out. So I guess that would be more to Chris and the rest of the council if you guys agree or disagree on trying to continue to raise this money and then we're not doing with it. We're just saving the money up. Mayor? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> council Member Treaky? What the council member is talking about is something that is a policy decision which is under control by the council and not the staff. <clears throat> it is us who comes up with the plan. And if you feel like we haven't done it, then we haven't done it. But it is not a problem with staff. Okay. That issue does not have to be resolved tonight as to what we're going to do with those two mills. But... Um, uh, council, we're coming up to our 7.30 break time, so we're not going to have time to jump into uh, item three uh, before we get to that. So uh, is there anything uh, uh, anything on this item, though, before we, if not, we'll probably take a little bit of an early break. But uh, if we're as fine, council member, or <laughs> Andy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll run downstairs and get printed budget books, but I show, so I don't have to carry them all. A show of hands, one, two, three, four. All right, how many, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'll get you yours tomorrow. All right, I have five printed, so I'll bring those up, um, but just want to know who wanted them, so. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, anything else for Andy or staff? Chris? Mayor, can I just say, I, did, I didn't at the end, at the beginning, so I'll, I'll be brief, but 
Andy and his team, the staff who puts this together, uh, greatly indebted to the work that they do to put us in a position uh, to have these discussions. And, and thank you for the feedback and thank the com I thank the committee for the work that they're doing. Um, so just want to thank Andy and, and his team um, as, as they do, I think, excellent work for us and put us in a position to have these discussions relative to policy direction. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, so it's uh, 722. Andy, I assume you don't want to get eight minutes into uh, uh, the, the item number three. Yeah, only to take a break. So, council, let's try to come back as close to 7.30 as we can, and then we'll be up with our TIF districts and item number three.
So next up in budget, uh, the broadly termed urban renewal funds. And uh, we have representatives from all three of our uh, TIF districts here for any, I'll say, project specific questions or anything that I can't answer. Um, generally, I categorize our urban renewal funds as four funds, our three TIF districts, and then our downtown revolving loan. Downtown revolving loan is uh, always just kind of an estimate on what we think we're going to do in loans. Uh, there's today, I think there's $1.8 million in cash in that fund. The budget includes $800,000 for loans and $43,000 for general fund cost allocation, which is part of that internal charge that we charge all funds. And then now into, I think, more interesting areas. The downtown tax increment fund has a total budget of $7.5 million. This includes a million for debt payments, 130000 as a transfer to parking. Um, historically, we've done $100,000 a year to help offset the debt cost for the expansion at, I don't remember what park number it is, but uh, the Wells Fargo Northern Hotel uh, parking lot. And there's an additional 30000 in there, uh, assuming that there would be free holiday parking again this year. That would offset the lost meter revenue. I don't know that there's a final decision on that yet, um, but the budget anticipates that. So it's possible that may not occur. Um, $66,000 for cost allocation to the general fund as well as planning department. Uh, the three TIF districts, uh, since Wyeth and the planning division have uh, substantial uh, involvement in the districts, uh, they pay for a portion of his salary as well. The DBP operating agreement uh, requested amounts 307, 385. This is an increase from the prior few years where it had been flat for quite a few years. And there's 1.5 million in developmental incentives. $932,000 of that are projects you've already approved. Uh, those are anticipated payments based on prior approved projects. And then 484000 in generally termed anticipated projects. Additionally, there are uh, capital of $4.3 million. This would be financed through debt to fund the two-way conversion portion of the project downtown. And then 500000 towards the 25th Street Bridge. Uh, total estimated revenue is $7.6 million, and that's made up of increment of 2.9, interest income of 27000 and then the borrowing for that capital project at $4.7 million. Uh, just to show kind of what that district has done over time, uh, it was established in 2006, has a current taxable value of $7.8 million and a base value of $4 million. That's... 89% growth since 2006, where the city in that same time frame has seen a 60% growth in taxable value. In the South TIF fund, we have $14 million. Uh, again, about a million for debt. There's a $300,000 transfer to the police department for the debt on the evidence expansion. Uh, that, that was money borrowed from the general fund, public safety fund for that project, and we covered that debt through a transfer from this uh, from the TIF. 73000 in cost allocation again, uh, and then the operating agreement for South Billings at $186,000. $1.9 million for developmental incentives, most of that prior approved projects. I believe TPA group is about a million of that total, and then anticipated projects at about half a million, or at exactly a half a million, not about. Uh, in the South Tax Increment Fund, we have 10.5 million in capital projects. That includes the 6.5 million for the rec center. Um, and then there are unimproved street improvements. Oh, I'm sorry, the rec center would be funded through debt. And that's how it's anticipated to be funded. Items funded with cash on hand, uh, largely derived from a prior debt issuance that we used to uh, extend the life of the district for capital projects. Um, so unimproved street projects at 2.6, the Optimus Park Stephen Street. Uh, project just under 600000 Hollowell Lane, and then Riverfront Trail. There's current cash on hand of about $5.6 million to give you some perspective on how that's funded. So total, total revenues there, uh, $4 million in increment, $50,000 in interest income, and the $6.5 million from debt financing. 
And here's that same slide, but for the South Tiff District, which was established in 08, has seen 76% growth since then, where the city has seen 44% growth since 08. As a reminder, these are based upon current taxable values, not any projected growth. And then the East Tax Increment Fund, uh, smaller by dollars, uh, $1.4 million budget. Uh, 464000 for debt payment on capital projects done down there. Cost allocation of 43000 The operating agreement at 140 And then development incentives at 643 um, Not as many prior approved projects, but some anticipated projects and programs around 350000 And then the Fifth Avenue Corridor Engineering at 110000 That was a combined project between downtown and east. Downtown's presently doing it. East would be... Uh, part of next fiscal year, I believe I've got that correct. Total revenue here, 972000 in increment funds, 15000 in revenue, or in interest revenue, no debt planned for the East TIF this year. Um, and here again, the same chart. Uh, the East TIF district was established in 07, 69% um, growth since then, and the city's seen 52 and a half since that. 2007 year. Uh, here are the three TIF districts, uh, kind of by revenue expense category, um, just to give you some kind of comparison and put it all together for the three TIF districts. I believe that's it. I'll leave it there for questions and answers. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, how would you like us to do this? Just put questions to you, and if uh, any of our TIF directors uh, want to chime in, you can pass it to them, or if council, if you've got questions for the uh, directors as well. So we'll open up, and uh, we're going to have so many questions. We'll just start down here and move this direction. So Council Member Shaw. Thank you. Um, Andy, can you talk a little bit about the $6.5 million from the ESPRA that's earmarked for the rec center? Um, if that... So hypothetically, if that doesn't make it into a bond ask this year, what how, what happens or how does that affect this budget? Yeah, the, the way I see it, uh, I think it's kind of two approaches. One, we could leave it in the budget if council's direction was, hey, yeah, let's proceed with a vote. Um, but e either way, the, the bonding wouldn't happen, the expenses wouldn't happen unless there was uh, approval by the voters on a bond project. You could take the other approach and say, hey, pull it out, and then we'll amend the budget if there's an approval later. I think either way is fine. Um, likely, uh, depending on the timing of tax proceeds, how projects are, we may be bringing a budget amendment back if there is a vote that's um, in the favor of uh, additional investments in parks. I mean, I like leaving it in there because it signals the interest and that, that we're moving forward with the project regardless. But can you remind me also how many years we have to maximize that amount that could be borrowed through the South Tiff District? Well, it was established in 08. So um, we have 39 years from then. Uh, I believe we have 19 left. Or we will? I think. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry, so yeah, it could be, it's 20, it was a 25 year debt that we issued a, a couple of years ago, and that's that was right at the end of that window, so we are probably 23 years remaining. So we have another three years, if we, for a 20 year bond. We can issue debt any time in the next 23 years, but we cannot extend beyond right. what our current debt. And at that, is. just to remind, at that three year mark, it does start to decrease, right, because we can't it, it decreases every year. Okay, we but... Could, we could issue a 23-year bond now. Gotcha. next year, 22, 21, the subsequent year. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Customer Gillick? Uh, yes, I have a couple of questions on, for the, on the downtown TIF. I suspect EBA folks will be best uh, positioned so to, to address those. So, um, the... One question is very strictly uh, budget. The other is uh, uh, maybe a little more policy uh, uh, oriented, but sort of indirectly budget. Um, 
So the 3.8 million for the two-way conversion, that's not the resurfacing part, but that would be for some sig signalization uh, and striping. Is that uh, what the 3.8 million would be for? If I'm uh, understanding correctly, primarily uh, striping, signage, and potential signaling, yes. And um, is the thought still, uh, I mean, I realize it's in engineering right now, but uh, to do uh, four-way stops, as far as you know, is that, um, um, is it, I mean, it, it seems like the 3.8 million is higher than I would have expected, I guess. Uh, and, and always looking to, to uh, preserve more of that for leveraging um, uh, tax-generating dollars. Um. That is our encouragement, and we're working closely with the city staff and the uh, third party. Um, and, but it might be too early to uh, for me to have that answer yet. Uh, I know we're scheduling also a presentation for council, I believe, in June about that. So we'll probably have all those updates available then, I think. And Mr. Mayor, second question. Go ahead. Um, so uh, I, I do get a, a few comments from, from constituents um, who, who are paying attention to our meetings, which is nice, um, and they've seen uh, things that have been presented uh, to uh, DBA and then to council in terms of, of uh, projects receiving TIF funds, and um, they note a certain discrepancy in terms of what they saw uh, presented and what the reality has been in terms of, of um, what's, what's been completed. Um, can you speak a little bit to, to, I mean, can we condition payment of TIF funds not only in the completion of, um, of the TIF funded scope for those projects, but just the complete scope of work uh, um, that, that was presented. I, obviously, there's got to be some things come up, changes need to be made, but but uh, uh, let's bring those forward, I guess, uh, for for the the approving um, entities to to um, to to review, I guess. Yeah. So j just a question about whether or not um, I, I want to make sure that we don't have uh, TIF funds just go out the door uh, for projects that that seem like bait and switch, I guess. Certainly, yes. Good question. Thank you. Uh, the last two months, uh, Downtown Billings Partnership Board spent some time on reviewing that, uh, as well as inviting the uh, uh, attorney to discuss the, some of the language around that. But uh, ultimately, uh, every project has to come back with the completed project and the eligible expenses and uh, all the proof of eligible expenses being completed matching what was presented to council and only then Will we process the reimbursements of course making sure everything goes through all the vetting channels of ourselves staff city staff and all the acquiring all the appropriate documentation whether it's certificate of occupancy certificate of satisfaction um, so even in, 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 in essence, what I'm trying to say is when a project slightly changes, the expenses still have to match what was presented uh, before council. And if it doesn't come up to that expense, um, you'll probably recall the awards are always in the language of up to. So they may not reach that maximum in, that, in those instances. But in addition to all of that, the board is reviewing the development agreement um, language and if we reach a consensus, we'll likely have to consult with the city attorney as well to make sure they're all uniform among all three TIF districts. Thank okay, thank you. Councilmember Bernice? Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, no, I don't think it's so anything for downtown. Um, I guess I, it's the same, the same comments. I Again, when I'm looking at this, I'd like to see, kind of identify where some of the changes are and where they're, they're affecting. But um, Andy, if you wouldn't mind that you have these graphs up here, um, one of the things I'm always concerned about is, you know, how effective are the TIF districts? Are they really doing what they're supposed to do? And, and you know, you look at the South TIF district, they've actually, you know, you, you, you compare the, you're just saying, yeah, there you go. I mean, you compare those and you, you look, yeah, you know, 76 versus 44, that's pretty good. They got a consistent growth and, and stuff. But if I go to the downtown um, area and you look at that one, um, 
you know, they had a great start out the gate, and then it's been completely level and flat ever since. It's only 25% over the time from it was when it first got to the peak. And so it's not growing as fast as really the rest of the city is. And so I'm concerned that we continue to, to move these districts forward and are not picking the right projects. Um, and so I don't know what the projects were that catalysted it up so high to begin with, and that's something that we probably should have a look at and find out so we, we can get that information. Um, because, you know, I hate to fund, continue to fund, you know, a TIF district that's just doing less than what the city is doing in a lot of cases. And then if we look down at the, um, if you go down to the, the bottom one, sorry, I went kind of order a little bit, uh, uh, to the east, um, Ebert. And, you know, that one there, you know, had a little falter at the beginning, but then it, it looked like it did really well. But in the last, what, in 2017, it's kind of flattened out. And so... It tells me that maybe some of our TIF, uh, and again, it's to Council Member Cherokee's point, is it's really a policy decision we as a council have to make. Is I'm, I'm concerned that we um, are not seeing projects that are going to continue to to um, uh, catalyst these. So when we look at some of these projects that are they're talking about future projects in here, um, I guess this is really to all the TIF, TIF members, is really what projects are, are we going to use and, again, approve because I'd hate to continue to fund an operation that is not um, really showing some results. And, and again, I don't I guess the question would be is, is there any good way to measure these TIF districts and how they're performing other than just looking at these graphs and saying, well, you know, yeah, it came out the gate, but now it's kind of faltered. Why? What, what do we as a council need to do to, to make decisions to change that so it can start going up uphill again? So I'm the last person you want to ask about economic development decisions <laughs> and what's a good strategy for that. But uh, I, I think very good questions and yeah, I should cer certainly be mindful and thoughtful about what projects will grow the tax base. I think that's the spirit of the TIF districts. With respect to downtown, their tax base is, has some major uh, Companies in their tax base. One is a telecommunications and Northwestern as well. A railroad. A railroad, AT and T, um, and they are centrally assessed, which is not based on that individual property's value. Right. And that the, the major declines you see are largely the centrally assessed properties, who I'll say, for lack of a better term, uh, protest their valuation on a statewide basis. So the state says, here's your valuation, AT&T, and then the state allocates it out to different areas of the state based upon investments they've made. So that one, I think, is maybe a little misleading because that is kind of a heavy anchor in that district that really brings down that value when, those, um, when that company protests their taxes. Not so much the case in the other districts. They do have centrally assessed properties, but they're not a large portion of the tax base. Think, and I think that's a good explanation that would be helpful to know then, okay, net of the centrally, the impact of the centrally assessed, really how is that district performing? And that we can't tell based upon, you know, and that would be, and that may not be, there may be a lot of work to, to get that information, but maybe you can have an average of what the centrally based have done versus, you know, the rest of the city. But that, that's the kind of thing, again, without knowing, seeing that information, we just don't know is, well, why do we continue to fund this mm -hmm. uh, at all? So... so I do know that the decline in, I believe, 15 to 17 was almost exclusively related to the right. centrally assessed property. I haven't looked at it. I mean, I look at them, it's a large portion when we get declines, but if you pulled those out, I think you'd have seen pretty flat over those years, uh, flat valuation. Okay. Thank you. Mayor, I did have one question. I'm Go sorry ahead. for the, for the um, uh, moment. I apologize. I should ask when he was still up there. I uh, had it written down but forgot to ask. Uh, Mehmet, with the downtown uh, two-way street conversion, which I, I'm okay with, and uh, but I'm not okay, and I hear a lot more people talking about the back and parking. They don't like it. Have you? Are, are you guys doing anything to survey the business owners? Because when I go down and ask the business owners, they tell me they hate it. So or can you give us some good... Um, you know, study not just my anecdotal, you know, evidence of seeing a few merchants out there. So, and that's Mehmet, just let's make it quick, just because that's obviously not a budget thing per se. But since you're, we got you. 
Yeah. yeah Sorry. It, thank you, Mayor. It, it is on our list of things to do. Thank you so much for that question. We did survey the public recently, but it was on the two-way component. It wasn't on the parking, but we did receive also some feedback on the parking, um, just coincidentally while we did that survey on the two-way. But we do intend to survey uh, businesses and shoppers as well now that we're almost at the two-year mark uh, to see how that. But I will say compliance is almost impeccable. Um, Yes, when you talk to people anecdotally that they may dislike it uh, or it's an adjustment in learning, but they used to comply only until like when they knew they can get a ticket and then at five the behavior changes. Now if you go, you see compliance even at 10 p.m. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Council Member Owen? Thank you, Mayor. At, at the end of the day, you're fine. At the end of the day, these dollars in these funds are still tax dollars, right? They are designed to serve a public interest. And this council has said the number one priority for a public interest is public safety. And it is unquestionable that all three urban renewal districts have significant public safety issues. So let's just take as a truism that addressing blight mitigates crime and set that aside for a moment. In the downtown district, we see additional effort, right? We see um, a police officer that's being funded. We see adoption and aggressive implementation of SEPTED principles. We see efforts to activate certain areas in ways that are not just development. So there's this dedicated effort. People could argue of whether it's enough, but there is an effort to address crime and public safety in the downtown district. I don't see that in our other two districts. I don't see the same type of prioritization beyond just simply development reduces crime, blight, eliminating blight reduces crime. What's happening in these two districts to join us in the public safety effort? Because we just had a horrific weekend in this community. Grizzly murders, bad. Yeah, both of you. I want to hear what's going on in these other two districts so that we're all pulling in the same direction here. Okay. Um and Jim, if you just introduce yourself for the public who uh, might be watching. Okay, uh, my name is Jim Tevlin. I'm the consultant to the South Billings Urban Renewal Association that manages the South TIF. Uh, but let me ans answer your question directly. Um, when we first had our master plan done uh, in 2009-ish and then updated again in 2012, there was a whole list of priorities that we needed to do. And most of the South TIF was bricks and mortar streets and everything. If Council Member Boyette was here, he could tell you that we used to bottom out, you know, on some of those streets. Well, now we're in a situation where we've we've done a lot of that infrastructure, and now what we're looking at, and just to give you some ideas that uh, my uh, uh, my board has been thinking about, is in, in, as far as public safety is is concerned. I've had conversations with Council Member Joy. Is okay. How about lighting? We want to get, uh, you know, get a SEPTEB uh, assessment with that. Um, we're thinking about some measure of protecting Amen Park, you know, to, to, to keep the vandalism and so forth, you know, uh, fencing or what have you, lighting issues in the parking lot. Um, oh, gosh, I'm trying to think of some other items here, too. Um, the We in, invested dollars in removing a basically a squatter area immediately south of Riverfront Riverside uh, Middle School, um, and that's now a, a ballpark. So we're one of the things that we're going to be looking at specifically in our capital improvement plan. And you have to remember that TIF dollars, as far as my board is concerned, they're interested in in bricks and mortar. They, they, they don't fund uh, administrative fees. They can, but they don't. But what they want to do is, what can we invest in that will have a public safety uh, nexus to it? And what I'm, what I'm saying is, when we get to our, our capital improvement plan, I'm sure you're going to see a list of different items that will address those. And, and, and Jim, we'd be remiss if we didn't uh, remind the public that it's because of Sabura that we have a new evidence center, mm -hmm. three plus million dollars. And uh, thank you very much, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm Michelle Harkins. Um, I work with the board who represents the East Billings Urban Renewal District. Um, I've only been there since, full-time since January, but um, 
I've been working hard, um, I've talked to a few council members about this, about park activation and um, improving the lighting in the park and bringing more into the park. Um, I've been working a lot with my pig um, at the parks and rec department about how to do this, how to advertise it, and what equipment we need that is being updated and what would work better to get more people through the park. I'm taking the SEPDED training um, in three weeks so I can help um, the I guess the eBird with SEPDED and helping them discover what they need to get more safety cameras and lightings on their buildings as well. Um, we're getting a lot more community activation in the neighborhood. We're um, participating in the women's run. We're trying to bring the cattle drive back to the Nile. We're just getting more community participation in the neighborhood so we have more people coming in and seeing what the eBird is all about. Um, I would love to fund more safety. Um, I'm a one-person operation over there. We haven't raised our budget in years. Um, it's pretty stable. Um, um, I'm getting a quote from a few different securities right um, right now to see like what it would be to get a patrol a few times a day to see if because like um, Councilman Member Owen said we have had a few incidents in our neighborhood and it's devastating and. Um, that's like one of the things that I've been trying to encourage more activation in our neighborhood just to kind of um, alleviate some of that so people don't feel like it's completely um, inactive at night and kind of brings on that activity. But I guess any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Pritt? I would also say you guys worked on the Green Light yes. initiative and then also putting in a lot of, of the, the fencing that you mm -hmm. put in so it not only looks nice, but yes. also it kind of highlights who's behind that fence. Yeah, yeah. So we have the new fencing. We have put a lot of street lighting in, especially on Montana Ave and the other streets. Um, and then we're just trying to brighten up the area. We're putting in some pool banners and stuff like that to just help the community. And, and I don't know if there were TIF dollars involved with the removal of the Lazy KT motel, but yes, 100%. Uh, the, the organization and, certainly and was, and that was a huge step forward. So thank yes, you. Yes, yes. And that's um, the second hot spot um, in the eBird right now is the northeast corner of North Park. And that's why we're trying to raise the activation in the park to try to eliminate that crime hotspot. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Anything else, Councilor Rowe, before we go to Councilor Bajoy? No, thank you. Okay. Councilor Bajoy? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor and Council. And I would just say in South Billings, uh, TIF, they also removed the house that was at the Boys and Girls Club, and that property is now a community garden and is no longer used as a drug house. So just to add that to the list, you guys probably forgot a lot of things that we've done over the years. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Andy. Um, uh, basically, Andy, if you can put on your crystal ball uh, eyeglasses or whatever, with this 90% uh, uh, average increase across the community in taxable value, what are we likely to see for the increment? Because the, to Council Member Nisa's point, um, all of the uh, uh, districts have been stubbornly flat uh, in recent years in their uh, valuation and that increment, which is a little surprising when we see the amount of activity that's going on, frankly, in all of the, the, the districts. Um, what are we likely to see? We, we know we on the city's portion of the increment, only maybe a 6% increase there, but on 50% uh, 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 or so of that increment is attributable to the school district and the county on top of that. Do we know what they're going to do? Can we make any predictions about um, change in the increment uh, with the next reappraisal cycle? So, no. Okay. Next question. Uh, Council Member Tricky. So, no. Okay. Pre predicting growth changes in these districts has been really, really challenging. And to the point that I just generally stopped trying because, I mean, predicting changes in centrally assessed is nearly impossible. So downtown is really, really challenging. Um, if, if you take the assumption that they will see some substantial growth, I think that's fair. Uh, we, we have not done that in the budget. They're all pretty f projected flat to like 3% growth in revenue, um, but they may see large growth, growth in their base, or sorry, in the increment value, um, but likely what you're to see is because of the way the funding formulas work for school district, which I am not an expert on, and then the county, uh, they, they will not, they don't have the mill cap like we do. They're subject to half the rate of inflation. Um, over a rolling three-year average or something like that. And so their, their mill numbers 
I assume will come down because their value of their mill is going to go up. Um, similar to what we're recommending to you guys, but I, I don't know to what degree theirs will come down. The state 95 mills that it collects, which I believe you were including in your 50%, I believe the state is still going to levy their full 95 mills. It, they do collect it and redistribute for education. Um, so commonly, I think we lump those in as school district dollars because that's what they go for. Um, but in that area, I think it, it, it will truly, be, and across the city, it'll, it'll truly be a 19, 29% increase on that line item. I have not heard that the state is intending to lower those mills. I think okay. they're set by statute. Uh, it, does equipment tax uh, get uh, figured into the increment because the state has consistently reduced uh, equipment tax rates, and so staying flat might be something of an achievement it, uh, because otherwise it would be going down mm -hmm. uh, just to maintain might not be so bad. So business equipment tax does get included in our taxable value as well as the districts. Um, they have increased the exclusion amount, I believe, from 100000 to 500000 Does that sound right to anybody? They've Sounds familiar. Yeah, they've, they've increased the exclusion amount, so less of it will be taxable. Uh, what they do in lieu of that for governments is make it up in entitlement share. So they will increase our entitlement share. The districts get a direct entitlement share allocation as well. So I would anticipate an increase there. Um, long term, I don't think entitlement share keeps up with growth. So long term, that's probably not good for the city, not good for the districts. Um, but in the next year, I think it'd be no net change to tax revenue. Okay, thank you very much. Council Member Treaky. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to Council Member Neese's point about the effectiveness of TIF districts, I would not want to see staff spend a single moment on trying to figure out what is a good project within a TIF district or a bad project within a TIF district. Because the actual real comparison that needs to be made is the TIF districts versus the other parts of the city that we are infesting large amounts of dollars. So tell me, what's the comparison between Shiloh and downtown? You know, that is something that I would love to see. Frankly, we've invested millions of dollars in infrastructure out there. How much economic development would we have seen on Shiloh if Shiloh was still a dirt road and people were having to use, um, I forget what it's called, the, the little things under the ground in order to flush into. Um, septic you know, tanks. <laughs> yes, septic tanks. You know, so the reason we have TIS districts is to balance out the investment that we're making in spreading the size of the city and trying to keep a little bit of that money back in the areas which are being forgotten. Um, and it's, it, I mean, it, when Shiloh opened up in my in my area in, in Central Terry, I watched stores shut down and move west. You know, they may not have gone all the way out to Shiloh, but they went from like Eighth Street to Twentieth Street. You know, it it happened over and over and over again. And there is tons and tons of research and tools that are out there on by economic development, which shows this point over and over and over again. And those are the tools that if we're going to try to make a comparison about what's working and what's not working in TIF districts, those are the tools that I recommend that we go and look for. And as just a side note, there is also a lot of research that's been done on back-end parking and front-end parking as to which one decreases traffic problems, decreases accidents, and, and whatnot. I, I, I recently have almost been hit twice by cars backing out of their, their front-end parking spaces because they can't see around the big frickin' pickup truck that, that they're parked next to. You know, so yes, let's share some of that research, absolutely. But it doesn't have to be just research here in Billings. It should be research in other places that are experiencing these same things. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Roberts as well. Uh, Councilor Pearson. Thank you. Um, so I had had some questions too, so I'm glad you explained some of those decreases and how some of those have flattened out. One of the questions that I have, and I'm not sure that this is, you can answer this, but maybe. So how long are those TIF funds, once we've approved those TIF funds, 
how long are those still available to the business if they have not used them? I think it largely depends on the district. So I'll leave it to them if they want to each answer. Or do you have a specific So, uh, well, to me, want? there would be, a, shouldn't there be a set time limit? I, I think there is a standard language in the contract, yes. but does it, is it two years? I, I mean, if anybody knows, please come to the podium so that we can, if you, there's some sort of language in the agreements. Yes, Mayor and Council. Uh, sorry, earlier I didn't introduce myself. So I'm Matt Casey with the De uh, Downtown Billing <laughs> Partnership. Um, yes, it's all stipulated in the development agreement, but it depends on each contract and each uh, project. So if it's being re reimbursed in one year, then that's all they have. Uh, and it's typically the following year, uh, the following fiscal year in which okay. the project was completed. Gotcha, yeah. Um, and also, follow up, Mr. Mayor, thank you. So on all of these, the different, um, different districts, or, um, yeah, districts, Sabur is the only one that shows how much cash is actually on hand. Or maybe they just listed it that way. So am I missing where the others have that amount? So I, that was my entry. I only included that just to show, because there's a substantial portion of capital projects funded with cash on hand. Um, if you go, and I, I can get that for you as well. It should be easier than having you hunt for it. Um, but the individual fund pages do show ending fund balance. It's largely cash on hand. It's not exclusively, but it is mostly cash. Okay, so follow up, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Go ahead. So that I think that was a big issue with the legislature this time. There was um, quite a bit back and forth in the Senate and in the House regarding TIF districts. And one of our own um, Billings residents, who is a legislator, was really in, in, uh, watching the bond payments. Um, the Senate, the senator that was carrying the bill was looking at how much money these TIF districts have and what they're doing with it or not doing with it. And my understanding that the only reason those failed was because some of your smaller communities throughout Montana, they use those TIF funds for infrastructure and blight and some of the things that they felt, the legislature felt that those were geared for. So I think this is gonna come back. Uh, there will be an interim committee uh, regarding TIF districts. So I want Billings to be able to stand up and say this is what we're doing rather than always the kill the bill thing. We need to be able to work with our legislators, especially our local legislators, regarding the TIF districts. I think we need to look at it closely. And I think whether that comes from a policy level with council or if it comes with working with TIF districts, um, with Andy, and seeing what we can do to make it work for Billings in the way that it's meant to. Because if we have um, bills coming up after, out of the interim, then it may touch us a little bit closer than it did this last time. So that it's mainly a remark. I don't have any more questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Rupsis, anything? Okay, Chris. I just wanted to point out, we all saw how beneficial it was when the lazy KT was removed. We have, and particularly in the Sabura area, we have some of those peak high user motels. We also have some properties that I think uh, will take non-traditional methods it, some of which were target of the legislative session, uncomfortableness with assembling property, purchasing property. I think as we look at both the rec center, which was a very exciting positive project, there really is, that district seems to have the greatest potential in, in the short term, near term, to see significant increases. And some of our dollars may need to go into preparing properties and dealing with some removals. And I just want, we've talked about those uh, with the board and Jim and I have talked about those, but I think those are things specific to public safety 
and maybe with some real potential to not only save us cost on what we're putting out for public safety, net us a return in economic development, private investment of redevelopment of some of those properties. So just want to keep those on your radar as they're working through those. And we may see proposals come to us. We'd all love to see them in the upcoming months or year. And I'd love to be able to point out to the legislature, you know, call drops for public safety services and an increase private capital investment um, throughout our whole city. But in particular, there are some opportunities there, I think, for us that we have been working on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Council, we want to have an opportunity for public comment, including any of our uh, district representatives, if they haven't had a chance to say something that was on their mind. So let's open it up for public comment. And uh, you are the public tonight, I think, uh, you four. So um, uh, we're not going to prevent you from talking. <laughs> You can talk. Please come. We'll we'll run the timer, but we we understand that okay. we'll give you an no, extra no, two no, seconds no, if no. needed. It's eight o'clock. Let's be okay. quick. Okay. Um, one of the things that that I'm hearing here is uh, some measure of of you know how good is our investment as it relates to the the, the graphs that we're looking at there. One of the first things that I did when I became the uh, uh, the, the coordinator for the TIF was I went to see Robin. Uh, rude with the Department of Revenue, and I said, Robin, give me a roster of every property and, and what their market value, mark, taxable value is. And she looked at me like, are you crazy? Because there was like 2,500 properties. But being the accounting geek, I wanted to be able to, to tie numbers to something. And so it's, well, I got that, and then I was trying to look at, you know, I, I know that we had, uh, uh, that was dated uh, as of 2012, and I tried to compare it to like a street like Calhoun, where there's a before and after type of situation. And it's very, very difficult. You would think that you would see like a noticeable increase, but just I just want, want to just let uh, the council know that it's, you're, you're dealing with mountains of data and mountains of variables in trying to determine whether a project is good or not. What you have to do, what I came to the conclusion, was to stay at the 10,000-foot level. Now, what I do know, is what's been a drag on our growth, you know, not necessarily flattening out, is the uh, is the former um, Holiday Inn, that has definitely decreased in value. Well, one of the issues that came up in in the uh, you mentioned the state uh, the, in the legislature was they wanted to remove demolition as an allowable TIF expenses, and there was a whole host of things. I won't go into them now. But one of the things that our board is looking at is we want to reach out to developers and say, look. We can bring dollars to the table, and we're not necessarily talking about the uh, the Holiday Inn that's there, but it could be any place. We can we want to partner with you. You know, it may be kind of an overworked term, but in a public private uh, public private venture, where we can bring public dollars to level the playing field and to make it attractive to uh, a developer to redevelop an area. You know, uh, if it and one of the things that we can do is we can pay for a substantial amount of these. Uh, uh, I don't want to say remediation because that infers that there's some kind of toxic uh, substance there. But think of another word besides remediation, some kind of restoration to make it a level playing field and to make it attractive to developers. That's what we would like to do. We had our original master plan and it had this many items that we needed to do, it cost $44 million. We don't have it, so we, we took what we needed to do first. Now we're at a point now, let's see what we can do for these areas that are blighted and are continuing to uh, suppress the taxable value. I got six seconds left. Perfect, thank you. Is there any other uh, public comment? Michelle. Thank we'll you, give you three Council. minutes and five seconds. Oh, gosh. Um, I just know that we're doing a few things in the eBird that I know that are important to each one of you. So I just wanted to touch on what kind of that anticipated project is. We do have one full residential um, structure that is on the plate to come in. Um, we have two mixed use, um, one that's being renovated and one that um, we had a meeting about last week that's going to go, hopefully go through. Um, two commercial, um, one just bought another location in our district that's going to do some renovations and then one that's going to be new and then two infrastructure projects. And then um, we're working on doing additional projects in North Park, 
that aren't in the city's plans and that I hopefully won't have to get any TIF or any other funding from. I'm just going to try to figure it out. But this touches everyone's gears a little bit, so thank you. Thank you. Anything from downtown? Oh, okay. Then we'll close the public comment uh, uh, period on this. Um, uh, council, is there anything further before we move on? Uh, Councilor Pearson. Thank you. I had contacted um, Tina Hoger regarding a property on Grand Avenue, and I, Chris and Kevin were in on this email. And it's a property that's been vacant, shoot, I bet, 15 years or more. And I know that was an issue downtown, was a lot of the vacant properties downtown. So anyway, she was looking into a vagrant property registry ordinance. She said right now the only place is in Anaconda. So I think that's something maybe to keep on our radar to see if we can't do something, you know, with some of these vacant properties that I guess they get a better tax break for being vacant and not no movement than if they actually renovated them and either sold them or rented them out. So anyway, I would really like to see that because I think that is an eyesore um, in whether it's, I don't care where it is, whether it's downtown, West End, <coughs> Midtown or whatever. So anyway, uh, Jim, you kind of alluded to something about finding out how much, about these property values. So just kind of keep that on the radar. I mean, it's on mine. And uh, so as soon as Tina finishes her study on it, maybe there'll be something we can figure out. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Then um, that concludes an item uh, number three. And we'll um, move to our legislation update. Legislature's update. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, oh, we still have the bid. Oh, sorry. Okay, on to the bid. Yeah, that's right. That's sort of, there's two parts to this. I apologize. Katie. No problem. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Katie Easton. I'm the CEO of the Downtown Billings Alliance, and I'm here tonight on behalf of the Downtown Billings Business Improvement District to present our work plan and budget for FY24 as approved by the Business Improvement District Board of Directors. Um, as you know, at the Business Improvement District, we uh, work in alliance with the Downtown Billings Partnership, the Downtown Billings Association, Community Innovations, all together to uh, promote public safety downtown, market downtown Billings as the best place to live, work, and play, and facilitate downtown development. Um, our mission amongst all four of those organizations really is shared. Uh, in increasing um, and benefiting downtown and our community as a whole. But tonight we're talking about the Business Improvement District and the specific work plans that work towards these three main strategic priorities. Within the Business Improvement District, we really have four specific pieces that we're looking at. One is our clean program, two is public safety, three, a public art program, and four, community engagement and events. If I could summarize, in a couple of words, what our priorities are with the Business Improvement District or the bid, it really is clean, safe, and active. All of those things benefiting downtown as a whole, and truly we feel benefiting our community of Billings, Yellowstone County, our region as a whole. Let's talk about the clean program. This is something that I'm sure all of you guys are very familiar with. You see our bid team out there, their cute faces driving around in our uh, four-wheelers, gators, mules, different equipment that we have. Uh, part of the Business Improvement District work plan includes sidewalk sweeping. That's something that we do daily. Uh, sidewalk power washing, snow removal in the wintertime, trash bag replacement, and all of the fixed trash cans on the streets of downtown Billings, and much graffiti removal. <laughs> this has really seemed to spike lately, um, but this is something that my team works on downtown. Uh, generally speaking, we we talk about moving uh, tons of sidewalk litter. Uh, we count uh, the amount that we do every every year, and we average um, almost 2,500 bags of trash removed um, out of the fixed trash cans every single year. We remove over 200 graffiti tags every single year. Um, they do an excellent job of this graffiti removal. This example that is shown on the screen here is uh, in real time what, what that graffiti removal looks like. You might have a very large tag, 
Um, within a matter of a few hours, our team can remove it. We use very specific materials, very specific uh, chemicals uh, to do that. Uh, and we have very specialized equipment that my team has very innovatively built themselves uh, to power wash these walls. And so you can see here um, just the impact that the graffiti removal will have on a building. Um, we have two new-ish pieces of equipment, one used new four-wheeler that we bought, um, and then we have a new four, uh, a second brand new four-wheeler on order, but as many things in our, our culture and our, our uh, country right now, it is just taking a little bit of time for that to actually be delivered. Um, but these are all pieces that our board of directors looks at. They try to navigate with us what our um, capital equipment needs are and be able to uh, add those in on a yearly basis. So it, we would expect that we'll have one brand new four-wheeler coming in uh, this year. Flower baskets. Everybody loves the flower baskets. They're uh, nearly ready to be delivered to us from Garden Avenue Greenhouse, which is um, the facility that plants our, our baskets, delivers them to us. Uh, we do all of the hanging ourselves, and then over the course of the summer, we do all of the watering. Uh, we will have 185 flower baskets this year. Um, we have about seven plus miles of sidewalk in our downtown district that our Bid Street Clean Team does. Um, so seven plus miles of watering. Uh, in the summer, at the height of the summer, when our temperatures are at 100 degrees, that might be a daily uh, thing. We do try to be efficient in our water usage, but this is something that we, we, we put a significant amount of water into these flowers, but the flower baskets are truly one of the, pe the components of downtown that we get a lot of comments on, a lot of compliments on sort of the, um, the, the beauty of these baskets. Um, everybody really enjoys it. This is sort of a signifying uh, piece of what brings summer into downtown Billings. And so we're really excited uh, to continue this program uh, to bring all of these flower baskets downtown. Uh, I have this sort of uh, straddling the clean and safe programs that we have here. Um, as you guys know, last week you guys approved and accepted a Montana Main Street Impact Grant on behalf of the Business Improvement District. Uh, this will complete the Downtown Billings Light Bike Trail. We're really excited about this program. This is going to include a minimum of 11 light bike installations and because we were able to receive this grant, it will also include a specific mural associated with every single light bike that'll be installed. Uh, the light bikes on the, uh, by themselves are impactful, they're fun to look at, but we really feel that by able to, um, if we can add a mural by a local regional artist, this just increases sort of the destination that these alleys become. The intention behind this program is to increase the safety and beautification of our alley system in downtown Billings, taking what would normally be kind of a dark, it's dirty, uh, perceived as unsafe uh, section of our downtown. You don't walk through an alley necessarily, but what we have found that is these light bikes are installed, the murals are installed with them, they become well lit, they become colorful, more and more people are going to visit these locations, and, and that, that is a proven fact that they are more visited. Uh, we know that we can increase um, the safety, the visibility, um, really just the overall impact of alleys in downtown Billings. And so uh, we use the example of the pub station as one that if you haven't gone to see it, uh, we have groups taking photos in this alley all the time, wedding photos, uh, high school graduation photos, senior photos, um, band photos, uh, just any kind of uh, group of people that will take their pictures here. It's a lot of fun to see those come across social media, tagged with the Downtown Billings Light Bike Trail. We're the only one in the country that uses hashtag Light Bike Trail. We're seeing more and more use of that, so we're able to track that. But this was a very impactful grant for us. We received $40,000 from the state of Montana. This is a community development program, um, the Montana Main Street program. So thank you so much for accepting that. We're really excited. Um, to see this project come to fruition. We did just release our call to artists last week. So we're hoping to get some great local regional artists come in, um, both uh, some, some youth artists that we know of, some Native American artists that are interested, artists that ha have businesses downtown that we didn't know are artists and they are interested in uh, doing a mural. So really excited about this program. And like I said, it really kind of straddles this clean and safe uh, programs that we have with the Downtown Billings Alliance. As far as SAFE, we also talk a lot about SEPTED. I think you guys are very familiar with our SEPTED program in partnership with the Billings Chamber of Commerce, in partnership with the City of Billings, in partnership with the Downtown Billings Partnership. 
We do have the grant program that is TIF funded um, where we match up to $3,000 for improvements that have been uh, identified as part of a SEPTED evaluation. These evaluations are free to anybody who is within the Business Improvement District um, and also to uh, chamber members through that partnership. Um, but we are able to fund a lot of great programs. I know you have seen this uh, before and after before, but we just love to show this off. The top picture is a, a picture of um, the visible uh, vault at the Yellowstone Art Museum before we did this evaluation. Afterwards, we said, you, you have no lights there. That's why you are receiving almost a daily um, calls to the police department. They did lighting um, in that project, and so you can see the after picture. It is a literal night and day <laughs> difference of what you, what you can do with um, pretty minimal improvements on that. And now we really uh, hear from the police department when they pull up some statistics that they are um, averaging less than one call a month, where before it was almost a daily call to the police department, strictly because of something like lighting. So I think this is a really impactful program, and I know that you guys also accept and believe that this is impactful. Um, we are thrilled to be partnering to offer the training coming up. I know a lot of city staff are doing that. I think that is an absolutely excellent, excellent decision. I'm really excited to see how that comes to be. Um, safe, uh, the biggest piece of our, our SAFE program that happened this year and will continue on to this next year is that we added a third officer. This was really what we were hearing from the business owners who participated in the business improvement district that they wanted extended hours and so we thought a, a third officer would add that. So Officer Fonti is our third officer. Um, so now we have uh, coverage Monday through Saturday. Currently Officer Fonti is on Tuesday through Friday, um, 11, sorry, noon to uh, 10 p.m. We are going to shift that um, come the end of spring, early summer, because the traffic kind of changes downtown, where he will likely move to a Wednesday through Saturday, noon to 11 p.m.-ish um, shift on that. I really sincerely appreciate the City of Billings, um, Chief St. John, with the flexibility that he allows us to kind of feel our way out with this third officer to really make sure that we are actually serving the property owners that asked for this. Are they seeing an impact by having an officer who is on duty now until 10 p.m., 11 p.m. at night? Um, so this has been really great to add this. Um, Nick is an excellent uh, uh, addition to our team. So with officers Richardson, Freeman, and Fonte, we have a really robust program um, really with the, the partnership with the police department. We continue our work with the Motivated Addiction Alternative Program. Cody Christensen, as our resource outreach coordinator, continues to work, and I know you have seen his face up in front of council lately um, as we are working with Substance Abuse Connect, the continuum of care. He was uh, instrumental in not only uh, standing up the low barrier shelter, but staffing it. He would um, volunteer <coughs> weekly to actually work at the low barrier shelter this year and continuing our work with um, all of the components of really uh, kind of interacting with the social services uh, industry and um, the work that's being done in our community, trying to really be involved in that still. We have um, what is continuing to grow into a very robust public art program. I talked a little bit about the light bike trail. We were also the recipient of a space to place grant through Big Sky Economic Development where we are planning to illuminate the 29th Street sidewalks. This is an area of downtown Billings on 29th Street between Montana Avenue and 3rd Avenue North that has just seen extreme growth lately. There really are um, no vacancies along 29th. It is full of restaurants and shops and continuing to grow as we have just recently heard about several of um, the, the very few empty spaces being filled for various reasons, a new restaurant, et cetera. So we felt that this really needed to be a district that was highlighted not only as um, somewhere that, that felt special, felt like a destination, but we, we also noticed that, that there's a limited uh, pedestrian lighting on 29th Street. So we are going to be hanging bistro lights over the sidewalk all along 29th Street. Um, so we're partnering with all of the businesses there uh, with Big Sky Economic Development and their Space to Place grant and being able to illuminate, uh, illuminate 29th Street. So you can expect that project to happen um, uh, this summer as well. We are working on finding some solutions for the seating under Skypoint. We know that this is really a pinch point for businesses downtown. 
Um, we feel like it's very important when you talk about um, downtown development, downtown activation, that you have seating, you have something that feels like a really inviting and welcoming and safe pedestrian experience. But we also know that the seating that has been in place there, it just isn't really working the way that we want it to. And so we're working on trying to create that into an actual um, activated space, possibly with some children's play equipment, some climbing equipment, something that really draws families where during Strawberry Festival, during a farmer's market, families can spend some time. We know that the number one attraction of Harvest Festival, for example, are the stacks of straw bales. <laughs> so maybe we just need to throw some straw bales out there and let the kids come and play. But we really think that we need to bring something that um, draws families down, allows children to play and interact and engage. So we um, are working on that. We're also working with the uh, the Parks Department on the Sky Point uh, renovation that needs to happen, new sales, new paint. Um, that's kind of a different project, but all with Sky Point really trying to create an, an active and, and welcoming space. Murals, murals, more murals. Expect to see lots of murals this summer. Community engagement and events. Um, you all are familiar with our events there, but we have over 48 event days during the year. Um, that really is a, a pretty significant number when you look at downtowns of our size. Um, our social media continues to grow. Uh, Lindsay Richardson is our communications and uh, events director. She does an absolutely phenomenal job um, really engaging with our community, trying to get out these events, not only with whatever uh, the Business Improvement District and, and the Downtown Billings Alliance is doing, but also with what our businesses who have space downtown, if they're doing something, we'll share it for them. And so she has been doing an absolutely fantastic job with engaging our community. Budget stuff. I think the, the most important here, and I apologize that this slide looks very, very small. Um, you will see that the property assessment revenues went down a little bit from FY23 to FY24. And I wanted to note there are two reasons why that is. One reason is vastly more significant than the second, but that reason is that within our, proper, uh, within our business improvement district, there are over a thousand properties that have elected to pay into the business improvement district. We break those out into three different zones. Uh, excuse me, four different zones. Um, in the clean zone, which is the core of downtown, the properties will pay 100% of that assessment. Um, as you sort of move out and you move into what we call the safe zone, where they're paying into the uh, cooperative safety component of this, paying into the police department officers that we fund, they, they gradually pay less and less of a percent of the assessment that is uh, taken based on their lot square footage, building square footage, taxable value. Um, and so what we did this year, because we had several conversations with the railroad and several conversations with some of our larger property owners in the hospital quarter, specifically St. Vincent Healthcare um, and Billings Clinic, was that they own vast, vast amounts of property. And if, if we are assessing them in the safe zone two, which you'll see is at 11.5%, they are then responsible for a fairly significant amount of money paid as a bid assessment where they also don't actually take in quite as many services as some of the other properties do. And so we elected to move a lot of our hospital-owned properties into safe zone three at 3%. Also the railroads, um, they own a vast amount of property that is also assessed within the bid um, per state statute, also down to 3%. So that is the, the most significant piece of why that budget went down just a little bit of assessment um, uh, revenue. The second reason is that we also are seeing an increase in residentially owned properties in downtown, which is great. That is a number one priority of the partnership and the work that we're doing with the tax increment financing district. So we love to see that. But we also know that the, the bid assessment is really designed for uh, commercial properties. Residential properties can uh, choose to remain in it. Most of them do. We only have two who elect to um, exempt themselves from that. But we also want to make sure that our residential owners are not um, paying an undue amount for that. So, so we made sure to, to go through every single residential owned property and make sure that they were paying something that, that was fair for them. And this was, all was 
uh, designed and evaluated and reviewed by our bid board um, and, and brought to you here with this budget. So even though the, the property assessment revenue is down a little bit, we are seeing um, an increase in our event value, which was one of the reasons why events are in the, the business improvement district. We use a lot of staffing, a lot of equipment to put on events. Um, and we still we still come out on, on top there with, with uh, some reserves that then per our board's direction, goes into being able to replace our equipment as needed. We put a lot of wear and tear on our four-wheelers, our gators, our snow plows, et cetera. Um, that really brings me to the end um, of the Business Improvement District. I'm very, very proud of these programs. I'm very, very proud of my staff. Uh, they work very, very hard, and, and I know that you see the bid team out there day in and day out, hot weather, cold weather, so I hope that you'll give them a high five when you see them and thank them for their work, but um, a lot of really hardworking folks who have a deep, deep passion for, for downtown Billings and, and all of those pieces, the nitty-gritty nuts and bolts of it, um, but I am here to answer any questions um, to hopefully direct you guys if you, if you have any uh, further direction for us. Thank you, Katie. Uh, great presentation. Appreciate what you and your team are doing. Downtown is looking good. Um, my recollection from the annual police report was that uh, uh, calls to Billings Police Department were down 12% last year. Um, is that word getting out? That's a great question. Um, it's a good question. I'd love to actually take up with uh, our, our police department and those who, who work on that messaging. If I were allowed to uh, create the message and put it out there, um, I would like to tell our community that downtown Billings is truly one of the safest places you can be right now. We are seeing that if you pull up a, uh, a crime heat map, that that is true. The calls are down. We feel that you are very safe in downtown Billings. You are very safe to walk the streets. You are very safe to park your cars in a parking garage. You are very safe to do business down here. And so that would be my message. Um, we recently entered into an agreement with Community 7 Television to be able to create our own show. We have our own um, program now called Your Downtown where we're taking these pieces piece by piece and hopefully getting some message out there. Um, so we hope that people are watching that. We can also share those things. Um, we send out several different email communications. In addition to that, we have a postcard going out to all property owners within the Business Improvement District trying to gather some, some better communication lines with them, um, ask them to, to answer a very brief survey, but hopefully that's also a way that we can share some of these statistics because that is a true statistic. Crime calls for downtown buildings have gone down. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Council Member Gillick and then Council Member Joy. Great, thank you, Katie. Uh, great presentation and great work. Um, uh, any update on uh, the Portland Lou? Uh, uh, yeah, Mayor and Council, um, Councilmember Gulick, I sincerely appreciate this question because this has been um, a passion project, if you will, of ours. We believe very strongly in the need to create a public restroom facility for downtown Billings. As you all know, uh, voted in uh, through a CD, CDBG grant, um, through some tax increment financing dollars, through some bid dollars that we have purchased and are in possession of a Portland Loo, which is a very, very unique and interesting uh, public restroom facility. We are ready to go. Um, we have been able to work out with the city of Billings and how we can use the original location that was identified. That has been probably our number one challenge is just making sure that the location was perfect, that we weren't gonna run into any future issues, that this is a, a facility that can be longstanding, present for a long time and serve downtown Billings and, and our community for a long time. So we finally have the location nailed down. It's, it's gonna work out just perfectly and I just signed the contract with the, um, our general contractor on Wednesday. So we are ready to go. We'll have a, a final construction meeting with the planning department, with the, some city staff, and then we are ready to break ground and put that loo in. Thank you, Councilor Bajoy. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. And Council Member Gulick asked my question. So <laughs> that was gonna be my question. But I would just also like, it's a great presentation, and I would like to say uh, one of the other benefits, we had a discussion about the um, investment we put 
into having vistas come to the city of Billings. And that return on our investment, I would also like to say Officer Fontaine is the return on our investment. He came to Billings as a vista. He did uh, was on, worked on a project assessing youth uh, substance use or abuse and uh, stayed and became a police officer. So one of the other great benefits of our vistas. So thank you. Thank you very much. Katie, I was in uh, uh, France, or I was in your, uh, uh, Switzerland this, uh, between Christmas and New Year's and saw uh, sidewalk uh, street sweepers. Karcher, uh, it's a German company, makes them. Um, I think they're about $80,000 each. They're just think of a big giant street sweeper, but on a miniature scale where you can run down big sidewalks and, and clean up, but you've got one person in there. Um, I, have we ever pursued that? And would we have the money to do it? Would that be appealing? And you zip up and down the, the alleys as well as the sidewalks. Mayor Cole, I appreciate the question. We actually do have a piece of machine. We call it the, it, I think it's actually called a green machine. And it is a uh, sidewalk sweeper where one individual stands in there and sweeps alongside of it. One of the things that we run into that I think it would be a, a big project that could be taken on by both property owners, by city, by the bid, is um, some of our sidewalks just don't allow for that mechanized um, uh, machinery right now. Um, if you were to run a mechanized sort of thing, we run into this a lot with our snow plows, um, our sidewalks are starting to crumble. It is a, a piece of infrastructure that probably needs to be addressed in certain areas. And um, so while it would be really nice, and I'm sure that Joe uh, Stout is, um, you know, cursing me from home that he would love for me to say, yes, let's buy those. But, um, and, and I think that we're always open to new technology. Um, and right now our boys, our men walk uh, seven plus miles every single day sweeping the sidewalks. And so um, we'll, we'll look into that. We do have a piece of machinery, but we also probably need to look at some infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Were there any uh, customer appearance? Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Um, I've got a couple of questions. One regarding the graffiti. We had uh, some gentlemen here about two weeks ago or three weeks ago, whatever it was, and there was an issue with graffiti. Uh, I think they were within the downtown area, which would have been within your boundaries. I don't know if they're uh, bid uh, participants. So are those people that are not bid participants, do you still do their sidewalks, remove their graffiti. Do, I mean, do you do this for everyone, even though some don't pay? Uh, Mayor and Council, Councilmember Parenton, um, generally speaking, everybody that falls within the bid boundary um, is part of the bid. Uh, currently, I we have in the past have one property owner who came to us and came to our board and said, I, I have some issues with, with the services. And so we said, how about... We'll, we'll allow you to not pay those services this year. We won't do those services this year for you. And then let's talk about that. And so we, we will continue to have those conversations with property owners. We would love to have a fully available and transparent process to be able to say, do you feel like you're getting full services for what you're paying? But generally speaking, if you fall within the designated boundaries, you are within the bid and you pay that assessment. And so everybody gets those services. The, the difference that you'll find with the clean zone versus the safe zone is that that clean zone really is a much smaller boundary, a much smaller district. Um, and, and that's where you get services to do graffiti, where you get services to sweep the sidewalks, do the snow plowing. And that's where those properties pay 100% of the assessment. As you move out into the safe zones where they're really paying primarily into the cooperative safety program, they don't receive the services of snow plowing, sidewalk sweeping, and graffiti is one of those pieces. Now, that being said, um, we feel like there is benefit, especially when we know we worked very closely with code enforcement recently to try to make sure that we're working carefully with code enforcement, the police department, and my team to really um, identify graffiti, make sure that it's being noted and recorded um, for code enforcement's use. And then we are really willing to either walk a business, a property owner, through being able to remove that graffiti themselves, providing the materials to do it, and in some cases, alongside the police department and code enforcement, go and re remove that graffiti because I do think our team is fairly expert at this point in being able to remove it. I hope that answers your question. If you're in the bid, you're in the bid. Um, but there are designated areas that get certain services. 
Okay, thank you. And I think that's part of the, the issue was that, you know, it's, it's one thing whenever a property owner will remove it once, but then when it keeps coming back, they're going, hey, you know, not my expense, not my job. So um, not that, you know, the bid should be doing it for free either, but that may be one way to get someone in. So uh, on your delinquent assessments, you've got 3%, which is uh, almost $16,000. So are those people that are just from year to year don't pay or they they maybe are going to pay or you just assess them and then you write it off? Uh, Mayor and Council, Council Member Parenton, our process um, in this, this tax assessment is that we receive GIS information from the county. We put it into our workbook. We kind of do our specific uh, revisions to that and then when we feel comfortable that we've gone through every single one of those thousand plus properties and that we feel like everybody's being assessed properly i then just send a simple worksheet that has the um, assessment number the assessment code and just a value to the city and then they assess it alongside um, the property taxes where it is a line item that says business improvement district one if you are in that district paying it so we um, do not actually do anything beyond that as, as far as receiving the, the tax um, payments from property owners. Uh, that delinquent number is something that has been carried over kind of year to year as a sort of just a base value of this, this might be your percentage of delinquent assessments. I would have to go back and, and speak with the, the city, speak with um, uh, Steve Forsh and find out, is there a more accurate number that we should be carrying over year to year? So I can get that information for you because I'll be honest, we carry just a sort of a, a general uh, percentage that they estimate for us. So just one follow-up with that. So you're saying that the, the assessment for the bid goes on to that business's property taxes every year, whether they want to say, yep, I'm joining or no, I don't want to join. Is that correct? Mayor and Council, Council Member Parenton, uh, per state statute, a business improvement district is created by property owners when they come forward and say, we want to create a bid, uh, a, di a bid district. Um, in order to create that, you do need to receive 60% positive uh, uh, affirmative signatures that say, yes, I do want to be a part of the business improvement district. We average in the one in the creation of it and in its first renewal, over 87% positive uh, affirmations that they want to participate in the bid. Uh, we will have a renewal coming up in, in 2025, where once again, we will have to receive 60% of the property owner's affirmation that they do want to participate in the bid. Um, but per state statute, the, the business improvement district boundary does need to be contiguous. And so we really don't pull specific properties out. Um, like I said, we're willing to, to, to negotiate in front of our uh, board of directors. But generally speaking, uh, once you're within the district and you've received more than 60% affirmation, you are a part of the bid. Perfect. Thank in order you. To, to also to um, dissolve a bid, same process, over 60% of people saying they want to dissolve it and it can be dissolved. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anything else for Katie? Councilmember Bernice. Thank you, Mayor. Katie, thank you, um, and and thank your staff because I think they do a great great job downtown. And uh, and some of my questions were asked, but I really fo focus more on the graffiti because I think they do a great job down there. And um, I don't know if the city has looked at what you guys do and how you do it. And and there's been talk about on the council as far as policy decisions, maybe doing something about um, uh, citywide graffiti. Uh, I think your team does a great job, and maybe that's something the city should look at. But. Um, a couple of questions about um, the bid and 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 that and I and it sounds to me like there's you got the clean zone which is a smaller area but it's still within the bid and then you have the safe zone which is bigger but still part of the bid right and so my I guess my my recommendation maybe and would like to see the board talk about this and bring us back maybe a change in the budget to say that's that's include graffiti cleaning into the entire bid. And the reason being is because, as, as you know, our priority is public safety. And we know graffiti causes unsafe and more crim crime and stuff happening in neighborhoods. And if that were to change to where you actually included graffiti throughout the entire uh, district and not just select, 
Um, it may increase the cost a little bit to overall, but it would be minimal compared to having some graffiti. For instance, I think the Wise, Wise Wonder Museum is in the bid, but they're not probably in the clean zone. Correct. And the alley down there is awful. I mean, even the, the even the the parking things are just completely full of graffiti. And so having something like that, the entire area in the bid would clean up the entire downtown and make downtown look a whole lot better. So I don't know if that's something that you can do within this budget cycle, but it sure would be helpful, I think, to really fight that graffiti. You may put a lot, of, you may have to hire a new individual because it's increasing the area, but I think that would be something that I think, at least I know I would be open to, to see that uh, cleanness come in the entire, I think that would really make a huge difference on downtown. So. Uh, Councilman Bernice, I will absolutely take that to the Board of Directors because I think that you are you are right. Being able to uh, remove graffiti quickly is a sign, I think, of care, of community. Um, I would also state that one of the piece, the reasons why we lean so heavily into public art is because that also, I feel, is the number one deterrent for graffiti. We, we can show, uh, I think, really uh, clearly and concisely that by installing a mural, um, by installing the traffic signal box wraps that we have downtown. That is an almost immediate and 100% effective graffiti deterrent. So that is one of the reasons why we lean so heavily into that program. And I think that um, we would also really love to see that increase, but I, I will absolutely take that idea to the board of directors. So I think it's a fantastic idea and I think it would be well received. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Council. Uh, I hope we're done. Let's try to wrap up everything else before nine o'clock. Uh, we had public comment before, so we'll uh, uh, determine number three to be done. Uh, Chris, number four, our legislative update. Keep it brief. Um, session ends this week. That'll be a relief for a lot of people uh, here and staff as far as tracking things. Um, our critical uh, piece of legislation or investment uh, for is still in House Bill 5 for $8 million for the uh, regional um, conservation uh, investments around the reservoir. For the committee, I did have a conversation with, uh, with Amy and Steve uh, Friday. They are not able to join us on our June 14th meeting, but can and on May 10th. Amy can, so I'm hoping we can just flip that around as far as the committee goes, so that Amy would join us via Zoom on May 10th and then on June 14th, which is our next meeting, which my last comment is we've shifted to monthly meeting, back to monthlies versus the weekly schedule that we had prior to that. And that's all the update I have. Okay. Any specific questions about pieces of legislation or anybody wants to comment on? Uh, Chris or uh, Councilor Denise? Thank you, Mayor. I, I think there was a, uh, a note sent out to everyone from the uh, League of Cities as far as some of the updates, uh, as far as what's going on. So. Uh, one of them was uh, House Bill 262. It's on the governor's desk. It's the licensing bill. Um, it's, it's, it hasn't been signed by him yet. I just checked. But uh, please don't hesitate to email the governor. There was an email uh, link in that email. So go ahead and email him and, and uh, let him know that we would, um, as, the, as we as a city have said, we really don't want to see that go through. There's, there's too much risk to some of our current ordinances and that. So... Don't hesitate to reach out to the governor and ask him to either video, video that or send that back for a specific um, request as far as what licensing the legislator does not want the local governments to, to um, uh, regulate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, anything else on item number four? Okay. <laughs> and I, uh, then any public comment on item number four? No, there's no public comment to comment. Or no public to comment. <laughs> Um, before we wrap up, Council Member, uh, it will go on to Council discussion and I'll turn over to Council Member Treaky. It uh, looks like you've got it. I want to give us a heads up on a future initiative. Oh, uh, I'll make it I quick. I apologize. Highlight upcoming agenda items of Council interest. Four items, super quick. BBWA agreement that's uh, on the agenda. Tax increment financing grant for the Griffin Development Project. That's on your agenda. Second reading of prohibition uh, of um, uh, the firearms conversation uh, and just 
to make you aware when you look at that, fully vetted by the um, Operations Committee, weighed heavily in, and there will be a third reading. There's enough changes that if you adopt it as presented, there still will be a third reading come up after that. And last but not least, I've got the adopted goals and strategies there uh, on the agenda. So that's next week. Mayor. Okay. Council Member Bernice. Yeah, just a quick note on the uh, the regulation on the gun ordinance. Uh, that with the packet that was sent out, it has a, um, a version that wasn't accurate. So Gina is said they'll attach a new version. So make sure you look for the updated uh, version of the um, ordinance. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, any public comment on item number five? Any council comment on number five? Okay, we'll move, uh, we'll close public comment period, move on to council discussion. Council Member Treaky. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, next week during council initiatives, I will be asking for a minimum of $10,000 for a print run of the Billings Area Domestic Violence Task Forces Research Guide. They print it out every four years and um, they're, they're currently in the process of updating that right now. And um, we will, the task force tomorrow night is going to be talking about the website and possible ways to make it, make this data more um, current, keep it more current on the website and um, use and stuff like that. So depending on the discussion tomorrow night, um, th we may be talking about um, asking for some money for the for the website. If you have any comments, questions, anything like that, feel free to reach out. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Gillick? Yes, thank you. Um, next week's agenda is fairly light, so hopefully you're not cursing anything, but um, I, I want to take um, that opportunity to continue um, with some presentation on how we become a higher performance community uh, in terms of how our development patterns and what we within the policy uh, realm can be doing. Um, so I, I would plan to, to bring a uh, presentation uh, forward again as well. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Ripsis. Thank you, Mayor. Council, I just wanted to uh, fill everybody in. Uh, following up on the MRM contract discussion from last week, you might have seen the email that came out uh, from Oksana. I had a good conversation with her um, uh, last week. Uh, after the meeting, um, they are not interested in um, the conditions that would make it acceptable to, to Council to uh, have this contract go forward. So um, that is a no-go. I will not be bringing that up for reconsideration next uh, week. And any ideas any of us have to uh, improve that collaboration in, in that community, I think, is are sorely needed. So um, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, last Friday, Partners for Parks had a fundraiser. They continued to work hard to uh, uh, bring attention to the needs of our park system. Thank you very much. Speaking of parks, if anybody's interested, on Saturday at Centennial Park, there will be a uh, tree planting opportunity. Uh, uh, Faithy Church uh, will have a work crew there to plant 30 or 40 trees, something like that. Saturday or Thursday? Um, I, I, uh, Saturday, May 6th. Okay. Yep. Okay. Anything else, uh, council discussion? All right. Uh, public comment on non agenda items. Andy, is there anything on your mind that you would really like to unburden yourself with? Okay. All right. Then we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>